Going live. Apparently we're live. Hooray! Yay! It's always, it's always a question when we start, so. <sighs> Technology that's the, well, that's the cost of the high quality stream that we offer. It's a lot of data. It's got to catch up, you know. It is, it you is. You wouldn't understand. I don't, I don't it know. is a super yeah. lot of data. OK. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, one and all, to another episode of Red Dot Forum's Camera Talk, where we talk about cameras. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much on the nose. Yeah. I am David Farkas, uh, joined by Josh Lair. Howdy. Producing the show, as always, we've got Jose. Hello, guys. He'll be feeding us questions from you guys mm -hmm. that you leave in the chats. Mm -hmm. Also, you can uh, give a shout out to Kirsten, who's in the comments. Can't hear her, can't see her. She's there. But she's there, so she if is. you uh, ask a question, we are not magically typing into the comments. <laughs> she is. She's she's on it. Thank you, Kirsten. So thank you, Kirsten. All right. And uh, yeah, we're we're ready to dive into it. Yeah. If you uh, are just joining us, you can, and you haven't seen our previous episodes, you can check out on our channel. Just make sure to subscribe. Uh, we have episodes ready on the mm -hmm. on the M10 or M system mm -hmm. twice. Mm -hmm. Two parter. Two parter. That's right. We also did the SL SL2. Two parts. The Q. Yep. Q2. The CL. The CL. And now, now by popular demand, that's because right. this was one of the most requested the, videos. The most requested topic, I think, since we started. This might be the most requested topic. Mm -hmm. We can agree on that. Mm -hmm. To do the monochrome system. Yes. Which is unique to Leica. Yeah. Kind of, kind right? Of. I, I mean, mean, in terms of like the evolution and the commitment to... Because and, really, and if, are there yeah. other... Black and white digital cameras. There's, there's like some, a, a chromatic. Yeah, there's right? a there's a few, but nothing like they're like that's special a system that's like this. They're more like, like special that. scientific yeah. applications, right? Right, right. Nothing that you could just walk out on the street and, and just shooting. shoot black yeah. and white. Yeah, exactly. And you know what's really fascinating is I was I was actually there. I was there when it happened. Uh, in uh, in Berlin, Leica had their first Das Wesenlicht event, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I remember you know Dr. Kaufman, the owner of owner of Leica. Got up there and very, very Steve, Steve Jobs like. He's mm -hmm. like, oh, and something else. We have this, right? <laughs> That's right. And, well, not that. Not that, but yeah, it was something. It, it was like something that. like that. Yes. And it was like the this. very first, was the very first, like a monochrome. And it's like, this is a black and white digital camera. It doesn't shoot color, it only shoots <laughs> black and white. And everyone's like, what? Uh, wait, yeah. but digital, you can just click a button and yeah. convert to black and white. Yeah. Oh, we <laughs> thirty seconds <laughs> in, and David already it dropped something. Earlier. Not even past the intro. Fla my flash drive. Unbelievable, people. Okay, this is what I'm dealing with right now. Really Look, at least I don't drop the cameras. <laughs> I just drop like Not on camera, flash right? drives and my phone. All right, keep going. Where are we at? All right, but it was this crazy, like just out there idea. Who in the world wants a black and white digital camera? Right, right. Turns out, a lot of people. Like a lot. Oh my gosh, <laughs> the first monochrome was just sort of a. Like a test run for Leica. Yeah, and this is when 2012. Um, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the 240 was it 2012 or 2010? It was 2012. 2012. 2012. Right. And 2009, and this came in just right. a little, May, little was, less than three years after that. Yeah, May 10th, um, 2012. That's right. It was M10 because everybody thought an M10 was coming out. So it was like, oh, May 10th, M10. No. Yeah, May 10th, M10, completely wrong. <laughs> and I but I better, better than we yeah. expected, I think. It, it was a cool event, yeah. although it was super hot. The air conditioning was broken. Yeah, and typical. Yeah, it was like 800 degrees in there. But so, the excitement was palpable. Yeah, I mean, so we've obviously come a long way since then, um, since that 2012 monochrome launch. Yeah. Well, I think years later now. Yeah, we're, which is crazy to think about. Wow. And, I, and I, I do want to define a little bit of um, terminology sure. with regard to kind of this, the three, because there are three generations mm -hmm. of Leica's mm -hmm. monochrome. If we, when the first one came out, it was the Leica M monochrome. Very simple. The second yep. one came out in 2015. Three that's years right. Later, right. That's right. Yeah. The M monochrome type 246. That was the period when Leica was using those type numbers, type designations, and didn't last that long. But so yeah. And sometimes we'll call it just the 246 or, or the, the MM 246. We have various or the M 246. Right. If it has the number 246 in it, you can assume we're talking about the CMOS. Yes. 24 megapixel yes. full frame. Second right. generation. Yeah, and you should point out that the the original monochrome. Yes. The M monochrome, just M monochrome, yes. is also referred to as M9M. Right, M or M9 monochrome. Or M9 monochrome. Because it was based on the M9. Right, which is a yeah. full frame, yes. 18 megapixel CCD. Yes. Okay, and so we went from 18 megapixel right. CCD yes. to 
24 megapixel CMOS. Exactly. So now, where are we at? Now, we're at the M10 monochrome. So, we have M monochrome, M monochrome type 246, M10 monochrome. Also referred to in shorthand as M10M. Yeah. We want to get that out of the way because we're we'll going to talk these use, words a lot. Right. Various yeah. versions of each one. Yep. Um, so, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, Thankfully, no, they're all three different resolutions. So, we can always say, oh, it's the 24 megapixel one. Or the right, 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 right. So, right. Oh, and then the M10, see, that's a little different, right? Because right. the M9 right. was. 18 megapixel and right. the M9 monochrome, right. we're going to call it that. It's not the real name. Right. But the M9 monochrome was also 18 megapixel. Mm -hmm. And the M type 240 was 24 megapixel. Mm -hmm. And the M246, based on that, was also 24 megapixel. Yeah. You're noticing a trend, right? That's right, yeah. But the M10 monochrome. Well, they said we assumed the M10 monochrome would before be, it was right. real, would That's be right. a 24 megapixel. Just like the previous two. Right. And like the M10, which it was based on. Except. It's not. It's not. It's we were shocked that a brand new sensor, unique to the M10 monochrome, yep. 41 megapixel monochrome mm -hmm. sensor, mm -hmm. uh, when that camera came out just this year, uh, January 7th or something, February, I don't remember. Sometime earlier this year. Um, so yeah. that really was a huge departure for Leica because yeah, January was the first. Right. Yeah, the first time they've made a monochrome whose sensor was not the same resolution as its color sibling. So this was a yeah. big deal. Um, and now we've had a number of months to really use this camera and work with the camera and see mm -hmm. where it fits in with the current generation of color cameras and also its predecessors, the other mm -hmm. monochromes. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Among so, other things, answering questions. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. But I think, uh, David, before we even get into all those questions, you should talk a little bit about, emphasis on a little bit, about what, what is a monochrome camera? Because we take it for granted. We've had these toys sure. for eight years. But it may seem unusual, even if you have an M camera yeah. already, yeah, film yeah. or digital, why, what makes this camera so different from the sensor standpoint? Sure. Um, I, I think also, let me, let me just preface that. Oh, there's a preface. Here we there's go. There's a preface. OK, so here's the preface. <laughs> yes. Um, I, just like before, if you haven't watched the videos, or if you have and you forgot, down below the video, if you scroll okay. down, into the description, uh, if you're on mobile, you might have to just actually click a thing to expand the description. Uh, I have left a plethora of links. Copious amounts. A copious plethora. <laughs> that's that's not right. actually a thing. No. I have left a lot of links yes. related to M monochrome content, the original M9 monochrome, uh, the M246, and the current M10 monochrome. Mm -hmm. I highly encourage you, after the video, go through those links, explore, check it out, because I, I do think it's going to be enlightening yeah. if you know, we might be glossing over things because we, right, we only, only have, have so much time. So much yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, and listen, in my articles, I'm going to be straight up. Like what I lack in, in brevity, I make up for in completeness. So yeah. check it out. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't exactly give you all this information right now. Right. I'm going right, to try there. to distill it in, into like key points, right? right. Let, let's just hit on the key points. Yeah. And then please check out the links if you want to learn a lot more. So, so back to my question. With, yes, what is a that, monochrome camera? Go. Right. So with that, a monochrome camera only shoots black and white. Now, mm -hmm. stretch your, your thinking a little bit because all digital sensors in digital cameras are black and white capture devices. They only see black and white. They see luminance, which is just light values. The only reason that a color sensor in a color camera records color is because something called a color filter array or a buyer filter array. And this is a, that checkerboard pattern of red, green, red, green, red, green, and then green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, red, green, red, green. Uh, and it just looks like a colored checker pattern. That was invented by a guy, Bayer, uh, who worked for Eastman Kodak Company, who also invented digital camera. And they also invented the color digital camera. Uh, there is a, a second sort of weird thing called Foveon that Sigma uses. Another story yeah. altogether, yeah. Those are multi-layer to capture yeah. color. But essentially, it's the same problem. Yeah. You need to have filters to filter the light coming into the monochrome sensor in order to understand what the what those color luminances are. Right. And then when you open up the file, there's something called a de-bayering algorithm. Or demosaicing. Or demosaicing, right? Because yeah. you have a mosaic of color tiles. Mm -hmm. So either demosaicing or debayering. Mm -hmm. And that translates those values into a full color image. 
a monochrome sensor, by comparison, strips away that color filter. Now, why is that important? I'm going to demonstrate. You don't have a red filter, do you? No, I told you I couldn't find one. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> either of us use one, so there we right. go. Right. Oh, of course I'm wearing a dark shirt today. All right, well. I'm going to hold it up on my forehead. There you go. No. So uh, imagine that these are uh, colors over the sensor. Okay. And it's a little tough to see. Let me try to align both of these with something dark behind it. Um, you might notice that the green actually transmits more light, and the orange filters more light, makes it much darker, especially because I'm wearing a blue shirt. The orange will filter out more of my uh, blue shirt. Now, why does that actually matter? Well, that's orange. That doesn't even filter out as much as red does. And blue, not that you'd use a necessarily a blue filter for photography, but blue filters out way more light than red, which is why, if you look at your little bear pattern, there is twice as many green pixels as there is red or blue. So 50% green, 25% red, 25% blue. Very purposeful because green transmits or actually filters out the least amount of light, highest light transmission value, mm -hmm. lowest filter factor if you want to get photographic terms. Right. Red is probably a stop less light than green, mm -hmm. and blue is a stop less than red, which mm -hmm. makes it two stops less than mm -hmm. green. Mm -hmm. Why does any of this stuff matter? Because it's what we call selective gain. In order for the camera to record at a given ISO value, first it needs to account for the filtration of the green, so you're boosting the gain about a stop. And then, to account for the filtration effect of the red, it boosts two stops from, from the sensor. The blue is then boosted three stops from the sensor ISO value. And what does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. If you've heard of blue channel noise, it's because the blue channel is the most boosted. So you're going to get the most amount of speckles and noise mm -hmm. when you push the blue channel. The greens are going to be the cleanest. Mm -hmm. With me so far? Hopefully, maybe, <laughs> kind of. I know I'm like, can we, really can we watch this? Can we watch this? Rewatch it if it's not clear. That's right. Why the monochrome succeeds, especially at high ISO, and also with dynamic range, which mm -hmm. I know Josh really wants to tell you about oh, later. We'll get into, don't worry. Is because there is no uh, per pixel gain applied. It's the whole sensor. Every pixel has the same amount of gain. And in fact, that is why the base ISO, let's say, of the 246, let's talk about that, is 320, mm -hmm. when the camera it's based on is ISO 160. Mm -hmm. Because it's a stop faster, natively. They didn't change the sensor out. Right. The difference is it just doesn't have that filtration layer over it. I think, oh, and even clearer way in terms of that aspect is there's literally a physical filter yes. over yeah. the sensor. It's like this. Three filters, right. actually, because there's three different colors. Right. Imagine so you've got these filters. When you remove a physical piece of material that is impeding some amount of the light that's reaching the slight sensitive part of the sensor, when you remove those filters, mm -hmm. you are making the sensor more sensitive yes. to light. Yes. It's like if I have sunglasses on, I can see when it's sunny, and I take them off, and it's way brighter. Right. Same idea. There's more light. Mm -hmm. getting to the actual light-sensitive part of the sensor. Yes. Therefore, you have more dynamic range, less noise, mm -hmm. because you'll have a more efficient use well, of the light. One of the definitions of dynamic range is signal to noise. Mm. Signal meaning the amount of information it's capturing, and noise being all the bad stuff that we don't want to deal with as you boost the gain. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, a sensor has a fixed sensitivity, and you just crank up the voltage on it. And it's like if you have... Imagine you have a you know a staticky record playing, right? And you, you crank the volume up because it's a low volume. What right. do you hear? You hear that hiss. Right. The music gets louder, but so does the static. Right. Exactly. So the noise is coming up, and that's what's happening when we raise up ISO, yeah. is that that background noise becomes so much more present as we're boosting the information in the image. Mm -hmm. Now, if that noise is so low, as we boost up our signal, the noise is still below a perce perceptible amount. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's yeah really technical. Yeah. So we, think about it this think of it this way: a monochrome sensor is more efficient. It uses light more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So it's more sensitive to light, and it uses the light that hits it more efficiently. And that gives you a file, which we'll talk about later, that is mm -hmm. dramatically different than what you get from your color cameras. So the the base piece of silicone is mm -hmm. the same. I yes. mean, not exactly the same, but the same it's, concept. It's almost the same. It's a light-sensitive piece of material. It's Correct. what's in front of it. 
Yep. Or not in front of it. Right. That makes a monochrome camera so right. unique. Right. I mean, look, at a, at a basic level, all Leica cameras, all Leica cameras, including the ones that are not on this table, mm -hmm. they don't have an anti-aliasing filter or low-pass filter. And this is kind of the same thing you're talking about, right? Because that's not filtering the light, but it's filtering details. Mm -hmm. And that's really common in other brands where they, they put this low-pass filter in to basically blur the details. Right. Leica is like, why would we do that? That's like, right. we make these amazing no lenses. No such thing as blurring. There's no such thing as blurring. Do it is not yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Uh, you know, so what Josh is saying is, is correct. The more that you put in front of that sensor, the That's less right. amount of information, you pure information that right. you have. Because your goal is to gather up as much of that light right. as possible. Yeah. So the more you're giving up, the more theoretical image quality you're losing. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I think that covers that. And we're going to probably talk about some of those concepts as we go through, but that's... That's the executive the fundamental yeah. way of. And if you want to read more about that, I yes. have those specifics in uh, my original, original M9 monochrome review as well as my 246 review. Yeah, we get into it much more, so you can really get a feel for it. But that is, that's what makes it special. Should I tell them about what's coming? Um, let's talk about that a little bit later. Let's 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 let everybody who who sticks with us reward that with the good news. Yeah, uh, I got a surprise if you yeah, stick around. Right. Um, so that is, yeah, that's what makes that camera so unique. So I think we should probably get to let's some take some, questions. yeah, let's take yeah. some questions, and then uh, we can loop back and kind of work in because we don't want it to be so overwhelmingly technical. Right, we like we recognize that yeah. this can get super technical. We're not going to go crazy. You'll see why later. Um, so we want to make sure that we can engage your questions at all levels. If you've never used a monochrome camera before, if you're not sure what it is, or you've had the past few generations and you want to know what's different, yeah. we want to cover all of that. So please and ask we see us there's questions. a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, so we'll make sure. it's okay. That's what we're here for, and we're definitely not going to get to all of them. I don't know if we'll do a part two. Probably not. Um, Probably not. But we're definitely accessible outside of this little sphere. And, and ask questions. <laughs> so we can. if you're looking at the video after we've gone live, yeah. we do monitor the comments. Yes, so David is on the comments all the time. I'm on the comments. Yes, he's actually really good about it. So if you put a question in the comments, I, I will give you will a real it. answer, he not a. Smiley emoji. That's right. You know, like, so please, like, 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 don't think that if we don't get to your question, we're ignoring you. We just, you know, we like to ramble on too much and interrupt each other, so we can't possibly get to all the questions. Um, all right, so <laughs> let's, we, we just said we're going to get to questions, so let's get to a question. All right. All right. So that was a very detailed um, explanation, but maybe more simple terms. What are the real differences between converting a color file to black and white mm -hmm. versus shooting monochrome? Okay. Well, it's I can give you a, like a, a one sentence answer. All right, go. And then you can expound. Mm -hmm. Here's my one sentence answer. The file's already black and white when you're shooting it, and the file's black and white when you bring it into Lightroom, and that tonality, kind of like if you were shooting a film, like a black and white film like Tri-X or T-Max, it already has that look in the file without having to edit it and tweak it and get, you can get there. If someone says it's impossible, it's not impossible. You can take a color image from, say, an SL2 mm -hmm. or an M10, and you can convert it to an excellent black and white image. Right. Really? No doubt. Yeah. It will take a little more nuance. And yeah. there is great tools out there like Did Silver you say this Effects. Is a one sentence answer? Sorry, it was a one sentence. <laughs> then I like, it's like nine sentences. I'm shocked. But there, there's also things like Silver Effects yeah. to emulate film times. Yeah. The difference is when you shoot the monochrome, it just looks right. Yeah. Uh, and okay. that, that's kind of my yeah, kind of post-processing point of view. To expand on that, and we talked about this a little bit already, more dynamic range, less noise, more detail. The big three. Hmm. Now, the specifics of that compared to many different cameras, so we'll get into that more, hmm. but that's, if you are shooting in black and white, a black and white dedicated camera, a monochrome camera, will give you a superior file to a color image converted to black and white. Now, just like it depends on your output for if you need 10 megapixels or 50 megapixels, you may not notice the difference all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're just outputting for Instagram and you're not doing anything or any editing per se, you may not even notice. You may be able to shoot right. an M10 and mm -hmm. convert it and you're good. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about really where push comes to shoves and, and the extremes and the really intense applications um, or where you're going to notice the most significant difference. So, I mean, I'll say that that we've hung gallery shows yeah. that are shot with monochrome, and you're like, okay, yeah. I get it. I tell. Yeah. And we're talking 
like big, 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 big prints. The size of our background, big. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, wall size prints, and you just like right up to it, yeah. saying, "Wow, I mean, that's amazing." And you know, you ask the photographer because you know they shoot with a bunch of different cameras. You're right. like, monochrome, and they're like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah, monochrome." <laughs> it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Um, because one of the benefits of not having this demosaic game where the camera is essentially guessing, although smartly, at we call how it to an make... interpolating. That's right, how to make a color <laughs> picture. So there's no guesswork involved. So every single pixel on the sensor of a monochrome mm -hmm. camera is one pixel of data in your picture. With no interpolation. Right, right. Whereas a color camera, that's true. It's only recording one color per pixel. 33% of the image. Exactly. Yeah. Or 33 and a third. Yeah. Um, well, green's a little bit more, but so true, true, true. Because instead of having one pixel and then it has to interpolate the other three colors mm -hmm. to make a color file, mm -hmm. you're having one pixel is one pixel. There's no interpolation, no guessing, no demosaicing, yep. so you get more detail as well. I've read twenty to twenty-five percent. I, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a that's a very technical way to describe it. You see it when you look at the files. It's you crisp. You see it's it. Crisp. Yeah, you see a level of detail that you don't see with a color file converted to black and white. Again, right. you may not notice it if you're shooting a 25-year-old lens and wide open, whatever. But and, I, and look, if you know. you're printing, if you're printing this size, yeah, you're not gonna. Notice. You're not gonna see it, or probably not, unless you've cropped a lot. You know, but <laughs> full frame, no. Yeah. Uh, okay, that was a long answer to that question, but we're gonna, yeah, get into a lot more of this with our further. And questions, I and so. I can even expound just on Josh's point. Yes. It when you shoot the monochrome, you're capturing 4,096 shades of gray at each and every single pixel. A lot, a lot of gray. Uh, but let's get to the next question because we have so much more to cover. Let's go. All right. So I think a big one is how does the M10 monochrome compare to the SO2? Mm, that is a good question. They're different cameras. <laughs> I think he means the pictures <laughs> coming out of the cameras. Uh, Although that, ironically, David's humorous answer is actually quite applicable. Yeah. Because the use case is so different. Right. Here's, they're two totally different tools. But I get, I get what he what the question's about, and we're obviously going to answer it. So. We both have answers on this and, then, and the various qualities. David, mm. why don't you give us a bit of a... So again, just to rehash, this is how does the M10 monochrome, right. M10 at, 41, monochrome. at 41 megapixels, yep. versus full frame, compared to the SL2, 47 megapixels, yep. converted to black and white? That is the question here. Ooh. These are the two flagships right now uh, from Leica. Oh, that um, sort of represents... Right, and they... Of course, you're holding an M10, I think, not an M10 monochrome. What? This is the M10 monochrome. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> see, hold on, please. Technical difficulties. There we oh, go. Oh, you, ha you have to give it to me with a knock. I have the knock. Oh, I'm oh, testing your hand muscles. Yeah, there you go. All right. So these are these are. So David, what are, without going insane, because I know we can yep. talk about this all day. What are the uh, things you're oh, going to notice? You're right there. You're <laughs> right. That one's heavy. SL2 black and white versus M10 monochrome. Go. Uh, there is a noticeable difference between 47 and 41. Mm -hmm. There is. I mean, I on. Maybe I giving away a little too much, but uh, you will actually be able to see exactly the difference between these very shortly. Mm -hmm. Like, very shortly. Uh -huh. um, I was surprised, actually, when doing some testing, that how much greater uh, detail you get at 47 versus 41. So I was impressed. You do get image stabilization mm -hmm. on the SL2, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Sensor-based image sensor stabilization. Sensor-based image yeah. stabilization, yeah. and even with, and of course, you can use M lenses. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. I can use my M lenses on the SL2. I get image stabilization. I get higher resolution. Mm -hmm. So far, this is great. Yeah. I get a 5.6 megapixel EVF, which is great for focusing and framing. And mm -hmm. EVF's world class. Camera's weather sealed. Well, not with an M lens. Right. But I mean, so far, it's yes, it yes. seems like SL2, right? Right. Ah, unless you really want to get something different. Uh, when we start looking at the M10 perform, M10 monochrome performance, anything, I mean, as you start pushing up, let's say, over 6400 ISO, yeah. uh, the M10 monochrome just starts pulling ahead of the <laughs> SL2, like... Well, I, from, we both did some testing, which we'll talk about, in different situations, independent of each other, mm -hmm. because we, this is how we kind of come up with ideas. We, we spent like the last two hours yes. nerding out yes, over, yes, yes. over all of our testing. Um, I, after putting the M10 monochrome against the SL2 in a, yeah. in a pretty real world situation with like the terrible lighting in our store, yeah. I was amazed. And once you get above 6400, mm -hmm. how the M10 monochrome shines. It just, I mean, it just starts not building just, a lead. Not just lower yeah. noise, 
But like, the quality of the noise, yeah, 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 the yeah, tightness yeah. of the grain. It's very tight. No artifacting or banding or blotching. Mm -hmm. It's not that the SL2 gives you that much, but certainly comparatively. You know, you, you don't know what you're missing until you know what you're missing in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, and dynamic range held mm -hmm. with the SL, or excuse me, with the M10 monochrome. Dynamic range held the M10 monochrome as you went up in the ISO range, which resulted in an image that was more workable. Yeah. So what did you find when you went to the high ISOs on the SL2 compared to well, the M10 monochrome? So when I did my testing, I didn't I didn't vary exposure based uh, to compensate for what the file was doing. So what I noticed is, you know, you look at your histogram, and I had a nice full histogram, and then it just kind of like came in from the sides as I went up in ISO on the SL2, like really high ISO. I'm not talking about 6,400 or right. 8,000. Right. I mean, when it started going into the five digits, yeah. I, I started seeing a crushing of the image. Right. What, do you, what do you mean by crushing? Can you explain that. Blacks getting crushed, meaning like there's not a, a, a decrease, shadow detail. A decrease in dynamic range. A decrease in yes. dynamic range. Yes. And an increase in contrast. Also a decrease in exposure. So as I was going up, the images kind of got darker and flatter, mm -hmm. and yet contrasty at the same time, which yeah. is not a good combination. Right, right, right. What I found on the M10 monochrome is, as you went up, it was just very smooth, very linear. I couldn't believe how good 25,000 was on the M10 monochrome. I can't believe how good 50,000 was. I mean, I remember when the original monochrome came out, and we were shooting at 10,000 ISO. Yeah, and we were like, oh my gosh, it was, it was so great. I, 25,000 is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And not only does it allow you to shoot in very low light situations, but you could do street photography. Super high shutter speed. Or you could do you could go to like F5.6 or 6.3 at night mm -hmm. because you could boost your ISO enough to stop down and not be at the mercy of shooting wide yep. open if you're doing yep. like hyperfocal or you know, from the hip type stuff. Yep. Um, so, and it's a good opportunity to plug, by the way. Yes. Uh, another video on Reddit forum. Oh. You can check out. Uh, Real world shooting with the M10 monochrome, which right. I was able to do in January before I went off to a workshop, and I did my mediocre street photography with it. I'm not a street <laughs> okay. photographer, Don't be hard on yourself. but it's okay. And I I went out at night mm -hmm. and I was shooting all the stuff at at 20,000, yeah. 25, 32,000, and then the next day I took it and I shot in a in a equestrian barn, really low light. I mean, there's no lights in there. It's just whatever's filtering in from the outside. And you know, shooting a barn cat at thirty-two thousand ISO, and it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. like crazy. This is this is something completely. And the thing different. is, a lot of cameras can give you a pretty clean file, but it's the cleanliness combined with the detail mm -hmm. and the the retention of dynamic range is what really to me to makes makes the M10 monochrome specifically so special. It's unique. Um, I have never seen anything like that, and how tight the noise pattern is, it's even when it starts showing up. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's funny, the other unexpected thing in the testing was as as you got kind of like to 12,500, it started to look like it was starting to pick up a little noise. And then it just never went higher than that, it just kind of plateaus mm. until around 32, 40,000. And then it's like, wait, what just happened? Yeah. How did I end up with exactly the same quality at yeah. 40,000 as it did at 10,000? Yeah. It's amazing. You know, the, the yeah. SL2 by comparison will go to 50,000. Right. Highly recommend not shooting at fifty thousand. Yeah, even in black SL2. and white, it's it. Oh man, I was, and I was doing some stuff with maybe two thirds of a stop under as well, just to see you know if I'm shooting that way. Yeah. And then the differences become almost exponentially greater. I mean, yeah. really, it exa crazy. exacerbates that. Um, so that's really where the difference is. Another major difference is the files from the M10 monochrome. Let's say at low ISO. Let's say best case scenario, mm -hmm. base ISO. You're shooting a landscape f8. You're not worried about high ISO or all this crazy stuff. Tripod stop. Down. Right, exactly. Yeah. Best case scenario. When you bring the files in uh, from the M10 monochrome and the SL2 in that situation, you convert the SL2 files to black and white. Well, what do we both do when we start shooting, or after we're done shooting, is we go and we edit. Mm -hmm. We get into Lightroom and we start doing our adjustments to get the files and the images to look the way we want. And once you start to work on the images, then you, you see where the monochrome file holds a level of detail and and smoothness and quality through a much heavier handed editing than the SL2 files do. Which is amazing because the SL2 has such a robust dynamic range, yes. especially at lower yes. ISO. Yes. I mean, yes. it's a it's a landscape machine. Yeah. Like I've been using this for landscape photography yeah. and it's 14 plus stops of dynamic range. Yeah, insane. It's amazingly yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, the, the monochrome, 
I, I like to use the word malleable. The files are more malleable considerably. You can do more to them. Mm -hmm. So when you start doing these conversions, especially with areas of gradation, um, skies, uh, landscapes, anything like that where there's subtle changes in tonality, mm -hmm. and you want to work with a contrast or put a gradient mask on there or, or whatever, you have so much more ability to do that hmm. with the M10 monochrome, even with the predecessors, let's say. All three versions of the monochrome, to me, what makes those files so good, aside from the low-light performance, is how flexible and how pushable mm -hmm. those files are in post-production. And you, and you see that all the way through the, to prints. Mm -hmm. I think these are the most flexible files I've ever seen, even more so than some medium format <laughs> cameras that I've shot, um, which is saying something. So that was a long answer, but that's because that quite, and that's not really all of it either, but that's right, the, the meat of it. Yeah. So they're both excellent tools. There's some crossover, so I yeah. get why that question it was asked. Um, but of course, they're two very different animals. Yeah, I mean, let, let's look at it this way, right? So the SL2 is going to be your technology platform. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, especially when using native SL lenses, mm -hmm. I mean, the SL lenses, you can watch our SL broadcast, yeah. but the SL lenses are so far beyond even the best M lenses. Mm -hmm. um, they're just designed to a much higher specification. It's the latest technology. So when you look at the SL2 as a as a system, yeah, it is amazingly flexible. Being able to use you know uh, compact TL lenses, APS size lenses, right. being able to well, use the speed, the, SL lenses. the speed, the performance, the, the ruggedness. It's autofocus. Right. It's image stabilized. Um, right. Everything. It's got everything. It's yeah. It, it's it's a different tool. Yeah. The monochrome is definitely, I would say more pure, mm -hmm. and that, you know, M in general is pure. Oh, yeah. But what's purer than an right. a, a color M10? That's right. Well, like a black, black and white, and white yeah. M10. Yeah. You know, and it really forces you when you know, at least myself, if I'm going out and I'm shooting an SL2 and I'm like, oh, I'm going to shoot some black and white, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my screen preview onto black and white, which you can do, mm -hmm. and you can do that in the M10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I get it in the editing, you know, in Lightroom, I'm like, Ooh, that looks good in color. <laughs> you know, it's like I completely yeah. don't commit yeah. to my to my black and white goal. Yeah, it's and hard. Then, and the monochrome just right. like oh, it forces it, yeah. you to be like, okay, I have to see, I have to visualize compositions that are going to look good in black and white because it's about contrast, tone, right, right. shape, foreground, right, background. Right, right. It really as a compositional tool. I mean, it really to, forces you yes. to be uh -huh. good. Right. You can't rely on some overly saturated, beautiful sunset sky to, to, I have, to make the picture. I have been you know? so dismally disappointed. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, look at that sky. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not enough. That's you right. really right. need. You know, and this is true with shooting black and white film as well. It's just, yeah. it's kind of an interesting in digital, um, world. right? To have that same experience you know, in digital, which was you don't associate that. It's that. You know, discipline. Yes. yes. It's imposed discipline. Yeah. Because, but you're certain, you're rewarded. But you, oh my gosh, yes. are you rewarded? Yes. And you know, when I first shot the the two forty six, I went, I reviewed it in uh, like half in New York City and half in New Orleans. Now, New Orleans, if you've been there, I love New Orleans. I, I always think of it as like, oh my gosh, as a color photographer, right? Just the amount of color and tone and texture, and the place is so vibrant. And I'm gonna shoot it all in black and white. <laughs> I'm like, oh, are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah. And I was amazed yeah. at the results that I was able to pull off. And in fact, since then, uh, for the last four years, we actually have been doing workshops in That's New right. Orleans for monochrome specifically okay. with a photographer who basically, mm -hmm. he does color work, but he specializes in black and white, uh, Richard Sexton. Right, so this, just to interrupt, this goes to, we're, I guess we're gonna segue to another question. Yeah. Because I knew someone had asked about this, why we do, monochrome specific workshops. What's the reason for it's that? It's different. I mean, um, just as I'm saying, composing yeah. in black and white, it takes a certain Because we have, what, two programs now? We do Ireland with Richard, and then we have New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Two specific, two programs, two workshops. Uh, Portugal our, as well. And, and Portugal. Lisbon okay. is black Three workshops that we run often that are dedicated to the monochrome, any version, or shooting in black and white. And because it is a, such a dramatically different way of shooting and thinking and seeing and editing Mm -hmm. that it's a different workflow. Yeah, it's a different workflow, both from before you make the picture to after you go to print it. I mean, every aspect of that workflow is different. Yeah. Um, so it's really it's really something unique. So, so yeah. to come back to the original question, yeah, right? Exactly. We've departed far. Why would you choose 
this right. 41 megapixel white black and white camera uh, over this 47 megapixel color camera that you can convert to black and white. Well, I think we outlined a lot of reasons. Yeah. Uh, it just depends which one means the most to you. Right. Right. Is it important for you to have this very pure classical tool that, mm -hmm. that forces mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. to really visualize and really, you know, as we say, it's not picture taking, it's picture making, right? Yeah. You have to work to do that. I'm not saying the SL2 isn't going to make you work for it. But, but it's easier. You'll be it's <laughs> easier, real, yeah. but you're going to be rewarded on, on both. Yeah. Just, it's a different experience. Yep. It's, a different, yep. it's a different experience. Uh, obviously, you also have the range finder, which you don't have here. You have the option of an EVF on the monochrome. Uh, you don't have an option of an optical viewfinder on the SL2. And a lot of people really like that, being able to see outside the frame lines yeah. and yeah. being able to see everything sharp yeah. as you're shooting so you can be aware of your surroundings. What I would say, is too, is if you didn't own either, you also have to ask yourself, how much am I shooting in black and white? I mean, that seems like an obvious question, but I know some incredible photographers that shoot only in black and white. Sure. So like, well, yeah, they're going to get an M10 monochrome and they're going to work around the tool yeah. because that gives them the best black and white. Whereas if you're shooting color, you have to think about that a little harder as well. So As I like to say, the M10 monochrome does everything well except shooting color. That's right. It's pretty bad. Oh, you could theory like stack oh, no. red, yeah, and oh, green, gosh. and blue, and then you know, combine it. Maybe. If you do some Googling, you'll actually find <laughs> that somebody did this. Crazy. They, I mean, they cool. shot with a red, green, and blue filter. They basically made their own bear. Fat yeah. Films. yeah. But that's... Actually, they made their own phobia. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was good. So let's go to another question before we go crazy over here. All right. So this one is related to what you guys were talking about, the okay. experience of shooting a monochrome. Okay. Um, this question is from Thorsten. He's asking if you can talk about what the monochrome does to the user, why color doesn't matter, and it might even make it more exciting for some people to shoot and, and see in black and white. Uh, I feel like I touched on that a little bit in terms of how that process is. And now I'm going to give you the opposite opinion of this. <laughs> You're been, not going to answer the question. You're going to argue with it. I'm going to argue with <laughs> I'll my, answer the question after he argues. I'm arguing okay. with myself. Oh, I see. OK. So I, and I guess this is the thing about photography, because Everybody is different. Photographers are different. Every one of us has a different vision of what we want to do or what we find pleasing. And maybe we have different feel on what tools work best for us, what our subject matter is, what we're passionate about, what we want to show to the world. And I think that's what makes photography so fascinating and interesting that there's so many diverse aspects and viewpoints on it. Mm -hmm. This isn't a one size fits all. You know, it's not like, Okay, you get in, let's use a car analogy, right? Does it go fast? Does it handle well? Even in cars, there's different style, right? Someone might like this style car versus this style car. Both perform well, but they and they both get you to where you're going, but it's a different experience. And I think the same is true here. It's a different experience when you are forced to slow down and to really be mindful of those compositions. Again, you can't just use a pretty color. Right. You can't just have like, ooh, look at that. It's a field of purple and you take a picture of it. It's like, ooh, everything's gray. You know, you yeah. have to really focus on it. And yeah. in school you learn, or maybe on your own you've learned, you know, the zone system and things like that to really maximize how to shoot well from shadow to highlight and to have information at each of those points. There is a skill to this. There is a skill to shooting black and white. And where I'm going to disagree with that, right here, <laughs> My buddy Peter, mm -hmm. who I do a lot of workshops with, who I'm sure is lurking in the chat right now, he shoots a monochrome. He loves the monochrome. I'm just going to use a 246 because he uses one. And he's got a what are you looking for? 21. Uh, I thought I grabbed a 21. I know you grabbed a 21. Where'd it go? This is? Oh, it's this, this yeah. right there. It's literally in front of you. Okay. Right in front of my face. Now, he will go out there with a monochrome. Yeah. With a monochrome. Okay, and a 21 millimeter Super Almar. Sorry, this one's a little beat up on the bottom. No, we use it. We use it. So this is a 21, and it's nice and small. And I'm carrying around this with SL lenses and a big backpack, and he's just rocking this and, and off in a queue as well. So he's got his queue for color, and he's got his monochrome. And he also tends to use either, let's say, an orange filter or a red filter on there, which if you don't know about black and white, that's we'll, going to increase. We'll get there. We'll get yeah, there. we'll get there. That's, that increases yeah. your contrast and punch. And he goes like this, and you can back up to the full shot here. 
And what he does, I'm sitting there like, you know, working the composition, okay, right? I'm like, oh, move a little his way, make sure it's framed up, you know, compose, like precise. And he's just like, click. <laughs> he's mocking click. you, Peter. He's mocking no, you. No, no, I'm admiring you. <laughs> Because, I know Peter's watching. So. Because he'll just take it at different angles <laughs> and shoot it like that. He makes it look easy because I shoot, shoot it like this. And, they look good. and you've seen this, yeah. right? I see him shoot these. And he's just like, click, click. And again, no tripod. Doesn't need it. Why do I need a tripod? <laughs> I'm just shooting a 10,000 ISO. <laughs> NBD. Yeah. And and then we see her, you know, we're in the hotel and he's looking at pictures on his laptop. I'm looking at mine. And I've got, you know, the postcard shots and all that. And I'm like, wait, Peter, what is that? Where was this? Oh, that's today. Wh where? <laughs> I was standing right next to you. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, he makes it look so easy because he has a great eye for it. You know, Peter considers himself a black and white photographer. And it may look like he's being very careless with it, but he's not. He sees something, and then he's just kind of working a different angle. He'll often just have live view on, and he's actually looking at the screen as he gets in these strange angles. I'm locked down on a tripod, looking through, everything's level. He's looking at it in a more creative light because that's what moves him and inspires him. Right. He's not interested in the postcardy stuff. Right. You know, so everyone has a different experience. Even when we're standing two feet from each other, I think it doesn't matter. It's there's a lot of ways that I can look at this in terms of like, is color a distraction? Is it not? And I think the novelty of the monochrome, you get that initially, right? You get mm -hmm. when you start using it and you go, wow. Like, but once you get over that, you start to realize that you have an appreciation for composition, shape, and geometry. A lot of the things you talked about already and contrast and light or lack thereof because you're not distracted by the color. Mm -hmm. And it, it does force you to think a little bit differently. And I think it also can improve your color photography. Oh, because for you're, sure. Because you're stripping away one of the most distracting and also relied upon the elements of photography color mm -hmm. and you're getting and again this has been the truth for black and white photography for 200 years so this is not new it's just new to have that experience without the compromises of film right i, I want to get some hate for saying that but there are plenty there are a lot uh, of so that's that's what's so interesting it's the the struggle if you will of not having color without the struggle of shooting film it's like the best and the worst you know whatever and i do want to add one more thing i'm shocked <laughs> I know. But black and white can be more timeless. Ooh, that's a good, that, you know, that, that's so true. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Mm -hmm. That's so, yeah, that's actually a really good point. Because um, it takes, and not only that, you were talking about stripping out the distraction as a photographer. Sure. It strips out distraction as a viewer. Sure. And I will use this example. New York City. New York City is a bustling metropolis with you know, bright orange construction cones in front of everything <laughs> and scaffolding and a construction mess because it's New York City. And there's yellow cabs going by and, you know, it's right. there's all this color distraction. And I've found that New York is one of the best, at least for me, my, one of my favorite places to shoot black and white mm -hmm. because you're not looking at right. the bright cab. It's right. Cab. It's you're one less looking, thing you can rely on, but one less thing to worry about. It's, it's not about that I don't want to focus on. I, I right. mean, I don't want that yellow, bright right. yellow, right. you know, um, Prius to be there. Like, right. I don't want that. Right. It, it, like, I want some, like, old Ford there. But you can't do that. Right. So how do you make your photos timeless? Black you take away these visual noise, right? You filter out that visual noise and distill it down to subject, background, form, yeah. shape, light. And, and I, I think, think we've that, answered that question. Yeah. <laughs> so you just know, I can see you're on a roll. Uh, and I, yeah. I love all those points, but I now do Now I want to go out and shoot black and white. The, the timelessness <laughs> is a good takeaway. So let's go. That was a good question. Thank you, yeah. Thorsten. Thanks. Um, let's carry on to the, it next, was very philosophic. the next question, please. All right. So Dan is asking about filters. Mm. Um, when will you use a red, yellow, green, or orange filter? Okay. So what we're talking about here is in the days and still today of black and white film photography, you use different color filters, meaning little um, threaded filters that go over your Can't see that. lens. There we go. Um, to change the contrast and the look of your Orange. photographs. Because there is no color, but the light coming in is still being reflected off those colors. And you have the ability to manipulate that by controlling what light is passing through 
to hit the sensor in this case or the mm -hmm. fill. Um, the most popular filter and the one you could use overwhelmingly is orange or yellow orange. I mean, interchangeable. It, yeah, in, this is a BMW filter. Yeah. And it is known by its. I'm trying to find. You have a white piece of paper. There we go. Oh. Got it. I got it for you. Here we go. Uh, it is known. We got a close-up shot there. Oh, uh, the way. Uh, there we go. You're dancing. Here we go. Sorry. Nailed it. Okay. So it is an orange filter. Yes. As you can tell, everything behind it is orange. Yes. So this is a BMW 040 is the color designation. And that is the most common. Uh, if you could do a red filter, it's uh, 091. Oh, I don't remember all these. Yeah, numbers. 091 <laughs> or 092. I'm going to say it wrong if I say but, it. So, but but just like Josh said, orange is the yet. most useful. Why? Tell us why. Well, I think you have to explain what they do specifically. Because right, so, think about a color wheel. All right, so what, what color filters do is the color that the filter is, is becomes brighter. So if you're photographing um, a glass of orange juice, that's a bad example, but it makes sense. <laughs> With your orange filter, the juice in the glass will be brighter than yeah. if you did not have the filter. Now, what? What, but what is the real effect of what people are really interested in? You're not trying to make orange juice. That's right. So what you have to know the color wheel, which David is saying, is every color has a complementary color. So orange is kind of in the middle of, not, it's not quite as strong as red, so it's mm -hmm. not as punchy, but essentially blues. It's like a greenish blue, like a cyan blue. Yeah, uh, blue greens are... Blue -greens darkened because mm -hmm. they are the complementary color cool. you could think of orange right warm color cool colors are the opposite of warm colors right yeah yeah uh red the opposite of red is is definitely like also a cool blue right right um so what it does is it darkens those opposite colors meaning what's blue in most people's picture the sky the sky That's right so it'll darken the blue tone of the sky and the clouds are still puffy white, and your trees, yep. which are green, green usually, um, aren't really affected as much, but will right. be darkened a, a little, little bit. bit. Right. The closer it is to blue, the darker it will be. The closer it is to the complementary color of the filter, okay, so the more Josh, likely it is to what, be affected. What does, what does green do then? Well, green is going to make your uh, violets and your purples. And what am I missing here? Right? Well, That's it. Yeah. yeah pretty like much. Magenta, magentas. Magenta, magenta, yeah, magenta. magenta. That's the color. I couldn't think of That's it. That's it. Violet, purples, magentas, that end of the spectrum are going to be darker. Mm -hmm. And your greens are going to be lighter. Mm -hmm. So I want to mention one thing before I forget is we're, why don't we use yellow filters? Because someone will ask. We haven't yellow really... will darken blues. Slightly. But it's so, but the other thing you have to account for is how, how dense the filter is, how dense right. the color is. Yellow right. just isn't a very dense color. Right. So, it doesn't have a whole lot of effect. Especially on the M10 monochrome, which has so much dynamic range. Using a yellow filter is not... It's a half measure. It's like, it's like you might as well just not do it. Because you do lose a little bit of light anywhere from half a stop to two stops, depending on the color. And that's known as a filter factor. Right, because you are eliminating light. Some light, because yeah. you're filtering out. That's what a filter does in this case. So. There is a filter factor, which is a, and you have to increase your exposure you by know, that amount. Longer shutter speed, or but the good news is we're not in film, and it's right. not a manual camera. It doesn't matter, right? and the camera meter it. just knows. And, right, right. If you, you know. put you put it on an Intel monochrome, and you're in auto um, ISO or aperture priority, the camera is automatically yeah. adjusting for that. And what's really cool is because we're shooting digital. Mm -hmm. When you put an orange filter on, you see the effect immediately. Right. And you could use Live View to actually see it in real time. That's what as I mean. Well. Right. So right. either using an EVF or right. using the back screen, right. you can see should I be using an orange filter? Should I be using a red filter? How come this yellow filter didn't do anything? Right. And so I, we don't really recommend yellow filters. Orange is the most flexible and the most useful. Mm -hmm. Red is much stronger. Much stronger. Much stronger right. than be orange. Use with caution, uh, for sure. But Peter. Man, does he make that work, especially yeah. with a wide angle. When you get an ultra wide, like a 21, mm -hmm. and you're shooting a really dramatic sky, wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. wow. Like, you know, it has that Ansel Adams. You want to have both with you. Yosemite kind of look. I think, I mean, I would want to carry a red and an orange, I think, for landscape photography, yeah. depending on the scene. How, um, how much you want to, how far you yeah. want to go. And if you have, a, a one tip is if you have um, M lenses of varying filter sizes, Get color filters that are the largest, step, step and then range. step down rings. So you don't mm -hmm. have to buy four different sizes. Unless you want to use your shade. Right. So if you want to right. use a shade on this, and need, if you want a you tripod, it's not as big a deal. But um, right. Yeah. But you would, if you use step rings, you're going to have to right take the hoods off. Take yeah. the hoods yeah. off, and then use the the step ring on that. Right. So they have a few options, but so 
Color filters for black and white photography very simply affect contrast. And they affect the contrast of different colors. Mm -hmm. They're primarily used for landscape. landscape, nature, photography, outdoor type photography. You really wouldn't use them indoors because you already, if you're indoors, you're inherently in a lower light situation. And even no matter how good the camera is in low light, you still want to do everything in your power to have yeah. as much light coming through as you possibly can. Some people also use these filters for portrait photography to soften skin, yeah. but it's yeah, not, not, a not much, yeah. much lower use case. And this is, if you have a color image, you've converted to black and white, and you start playing with these channels in Lightroom, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. Yeah, Except, if, you've, if you've seen in Lightroom the HSL controls, yes. uh, when you convert to black and white, yes. that control panel becomes a color mixer. And, and you have the primaries and secondaries. But. And luminance. There's a big difference here, good and bad. Because you played with this today. Yes. Yep. So, of course, using a, let's say, an orange filter to darken your sky with a monochrome camera. Orange filter, darken sky, monochrome camera. It's done. Mm -hmm. That picture, the sky's darker, mm -hmm. and that's it. You, know, you could play with lightning, but it's, it's darker. It's optically altered permanently. With a color image converted to black and white, you could play with those sliders all day long mm -hmm. and have like the effect of adding any color filter you want after the fact. Right. So you would say, well, wait a minute. Why would I ever shoot monochrome mm -hmm. sensor and give up that control? Well, like David was talking about earlier, the blue and the red channels have more noise. Mm -hmm. So when you start playing with blue and red Especially, channel sliders, yeah. you're introducing sometimes a significant amount of noise. As you start to say to this, say, this blue channel, which already has a lot more noise. Yep. Let me bring you out a little more. Come here, come here. Yeah. Like, oh, crap, there's noise everywhere. So And reds, too. The more you push those channel sliders in Lightroom on an image, especially a higher ISO image, oh, yeah. the more noise and possible even, um, I've seen banding, banding yeah. or, or other blotchiness. Artif 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 artifact. That's right. So you are limited, depending on your output and personal preference, how much you could push one of those color files. Whereas a black and white file, you do it optically, and there's no loss of image quality. Yeah, and I will also add to that exact thing, yeah. and that might be the the technical reason of what's why it's happening. Here's yeah. what it could look like: if you have have this landscape image, a mountain, trees, da da da, snowy snow capped mountain, and you have a a nice vibrant blue sky converted to black and white, you take that blue channel slider mm -hmm. and you bring it down towards the darker area, right? You're pulling down, it's like putting on a red filter. Mm -hmm. The problem is that your image isn't, and that subject is 100% blue. There's other colors in there, in the sky, uh, other tones. And maybe this will be improved with future versions of Lightroom, maybe SilverFX does a better job, but, but essentially uh, you can get little weird halo edges like next to the mountain, right? Mm where the sky meets the mountain, or especially where the sky meets the trees. Yeah. That can be a really artificial. You gotta be careful. It, it can come off sure. looking really artificial. Yeah. When you do it optically filtered in camera, it's balancing the entire wavelength of light. So it comes in and it looks completely natural. Yeah. There is no artifacting on the edges. And until, and someone's gonna ask, or think in their brain right mm -hmm. now, well, why can't I just use this on my color camera? <laughs> no. It doesn't work like it that. It doesn't work like that because the camera cancels it out with white balance. Exactly. It's irrelevant. All you're doing is making an orange image and losing And then light, correcting yeah. it out, and now you're just and losing this, light. This goes to what we were talking about earlier, how the monochrome files are more malleable in, in uh, post-processing post yeah. because you're not... With a black and white file, you're inherently giving away a bunch of data. Well, you have one channel. Exactly. Not three channels. With a black and white file, when you start pushing those channels, you risk bringing in noise and, and reducing your ability to make edits mm -hmm. without a loss of quality. Monochrome file, there are no channels. There's, well, there's one, one, channel. one channel. Well, there's one channel. Sorry, there's no, there's no multiple channels. There's one channel. But there's it. a drawback to that, isn't there? Yes, there is, which is? The drawback is you have one channel. That's right. And everyone's like, Whoa. so highlights, highlights, Oh, we need to have this discussion, people. Highlights, right. highlights, highlights, highlights. Well, here's, let me say this first before we start. Mm -hmm. The single most commonly asked uh, question or concern I have with either monochrome owners or potential buyers is, oh, I've heard that the monochrome blows out highlights. Or I've heard it's bad with highlights. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna buy a camera because it's defective. And I could see where that mindset comes in. Yep. And I, I try to educate people individually when I talk to them, but now I think we have an opportunity to really get into this. Yep. Um, about the nature of highlights with a monochrome sensor. 
David, take it away. Okay. PSA for today and for always, protect the highlights, okay? <laughs> protect the highlights. Yes. They're, the, they're your friend. Okay. Unprotected highlights are not your friend. Uh -huh. So <laughs> you can easily blow highlights on a camera like this even with a lot more. What do we say? We said a half or full stop more highlight range, dynamic range, than the M10 monochrome. Right. What, say that again, just so we, because we got to start with the what people are thinking, right? Okay. Color camera. Yes. Why does, why, if we already said this camera has more dynamic range because right. it has less noise, right. higher signal to noise, than this camera. Okay. Why does this blow highlights? Is it a bad camera? Right. No. When you say blow highlights, let's let's be, what we're talking blow, about is yeah. a the brightest part of your image, the whites, become pure, I can, pure ah, white. I can't even so do it. So when we say blown highlights, <laughs> what we mean is bright parts of the image that have become totally white, you can't recover them, it's gone. That's what we're talking right. about here. Carry on. So imagine if, right. imagine if this is very white, right. and if yeah, I it's blown it, out right now. There, if I put it, it really close to the light right. up this here. This is now a blown out highlight. Totally this is right. now a blown out highlight. Um, there is no detail in here. All that writing that was on there, you right. can't see it. It's gone. It's yeah. gone. So if that looks, if that's in your picture. Now watch, as I pull it back away from the light, yeah. oh, now it's not blown out anymore. Right. If that's in your picture, that's a very distracting element you can't fix, at least without no. crazy cloning. So that's why we want to avoid blown out highlights in general. And, th and that can happen in any measure, right? right? I mean, what you're watching right now, we're shooting this on the SL2 yeah. in log, which has a 15 stop dynamic range. That's why we're wearing dark shirts in front of a black <laughs> background, and you can actually see the shirts in front of the black background. It's why I can put my hand here, and it's not really blown out. Um, but ultimately, if I put something that's bright white an inch from my light, it's going to blow out. Because there is always going to be a limit where dynamic range just isn't enough to cover right. the situation you're in. Right. But you can see the SL2 does an amazing job with highlights. You're watching it. Mm -hmm. You see visual right on the screen. OK, the reason for color having more highlight recovery, meaning if we see something really, really bright and we go in Lightroom and you take that highlight slider down and suddenly, oh my gosh, look at that information that it's was all there. there. It's all hiding there. It yeah. was hiding. Yeah. It was just bright when I brought it in, but look, it's all there. The reason is because we have multiple channels, because you have red, green, and blue, very often when you blow out a highlight, at least visually on color, you might be blowing two of your color channels, but the third still has information. And because Lightroom is really smart, it can take that one information in one channel of the image and it can replicate it to basically be detail that mm -hmm. you can pull back. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have one channel, if you blow it, there is no fail safe. There's no fallback. That's right. There is no extra channel of information to pull from. And, and that's why you may not realize that your, you know, that your red channel has more information in it, you just may not even realize it. Right, if you're used to shooting a color camera and you're used to having highlights that, oh, I'll just fix them in later, or it's, you don't even notice it because you just automatically, maybe you're using one of David's presets mm -hmm. and it has highlight recovery built in, you, maybe you don't even notice it. If you, if you were to shoot the monochrome, any version, the same way, you may start to see your highlights are gone. Yep. So, well, wait a minute. Like David said, if we just said we just went spent the past uh, hour <laughs> going on about how how much dynamic range and image quality the monochrome has. So why? How do those two things? Because that seems like disparate elements. How do they come together? How does this make sense? Very easy. It's called exposure compensation. <laughs> um, when uh, digital was coming around in the early days, and you know shadows were just super noisy on these first generation CCDs. Mm -hmm. You know, when you had like a six megapixel Nikon and it's like exposed to the right, ETTR, right? Exposed okay. to the right. right. That was the mantra for years was exposed for the shadows. Push the histogram as far to the right as you can without clipping your highlights to get the mm -hmm. shadows as bright as possible. And then pull it back. All the noise in those cameras lived in the shadows. You could underexpose by a third of a stop and those shadows are mush. Done. Go. Like color negative film. Yeah. Color negative film, if you underexpose by a stop. Forget it. Ugh. Yeah. I mean, it's a disaster. Yeah. So... This is different. These cameras, and I would even say it for the SL2, I'd say it for, because again, highlights, but really important for the M10 monochrome or the 240, any of the monochrome cameras, underexpose. Well, let's rephrase. Expose for the highlights. I like that. Expose for the highlights. Protect the highlights. That's right. Expose for the highlights. So imagine if there's a scale from 
there we go, <laughs> from white to black. <laughs> okay, and then this scale represents the dynamic range of the camera. Just to, and, and let's say it's it's about okay, you have the least noise here and the most noise in the highlights or the shadows. The M10 monochrome. Just imagine it's shifted. So instead of shooting something like a color camera and knowing you can push towards the highlights and bring them back later because you want those shadows to be as clean as possible, the monochrome is the inverse of that. You make sure those highlights are fully exposed, properly exposed, so there's nothing blown out, and you know that all that detail is still hiding in those shadows. I did a test earlier today to sort of prepare for this, um, this live stream where I was in the store and I shot uh, M10 monochrome SL2. Mm -hmm. Same lens, same settings, tripod, I mean, exactly the same. ISO 400, yeah. F8, whatever. And I shot a, a big tree in front of the store in front of a super bright background, bright awnings. And I wanted to see, okay, let's put this to the test. So I shot the same picture, exposing for the brightest, brightest, brightest part of the picture, which ended up being about three stops, three and a half stops, underexposed from what I would say is a traditionally correct exposure for a color camera. Mm -hmm. So on the back of the camera, that image looked almost black. You actually only saw on the M10 monochrome, the only, or uh, the SL2, I mean, you only saw that little awning, and that was it on the screen. Wow. So it looked, if you were to shoot that in the field, you may say, oh, this picture is uh, this garbage. Picture is garbage. This delete. Picture, psh, delete. You may delete it. Yep. So, but I obviously wouldn't for this test, so I brought them into Lightroom, and I pushed my exposure back up by three stops, and my shadows, and I played with the files, just pretty much with the um, exposure and shadow mm -hmm. uh, sliders. No noise reduction, no games like that, no funny business. And what I, what I saw was amazing. The amount of shadow detail in the M10 monochrome, and I'm kind of guessing here because I didn't test it too specifically, I would say two plus stops mm -hmm. of improvement of noise and detail between the M10 monochrome and the SL2. Wow. So what I did was I saved all of my highlights. Mm -hmm. I saved more highlights than I would have in the SL2 shooting it the way I would anyway. Right. And I have more shadow detail. Mm -hmm. So the moral of the story is when you're working with a monochrome camera, Exposed for the highlights. I would say exposed for the brightest highlight you want to still have detail. If you have specular highlights that are like reflections, like... Um, yeah, they're never going to be captured. If I have a reflection off my there, phone, right there, like yeah. you don't want detail in there. That's a specular highlight, mm -hmm. like a shiny car bumper or something like that. Yeah. Don't expose for that. That wouldn't make sense. Exposed for the brightest white you want to have detail in it. And everything else falls where it falls. Because you know, despite the fact that you may look at the camera and go, that picture is way underexposed. Mm -hmm. If not, that picture for a monochrome is properly... Perfect. Exposed. It's perfect. And I, I think that exposed for the highlights is definitely one, mm -hmm. and and I I'm a believer of that on color as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the the way to say that is shoot for post mm -hmm. that you you have to know your tool. That's right. And you know what the camera is capable of. So as long as you understand the performance envelope and you understand the capabilities of the camera and you know without a doubt, without questioning it, that you're going to have that kind of recoverability yeah. at any given ISO. And you're going to be able to go out confidently and say, whoa, this scene has 20 stops of dynamic range. Like, what do I do now? Yeah. Um, and most people, I think, you know, like on an SL2, 20 stops, I would just bracket. Right. You know, I would just take three shots and boom, done. Yeah. Uh, and I do blend in an HDR in, in Lightroom and good to go. I think most people on on the monochrome are looking more for for single capture. Yeah. Because off tripod, single capture, right. why do you have usable 50,000 ISO if you don't want to handhold and pitch black, right, right? Right, right? So I don't think most people want to do and you can do bracketing, but I wouldn't I don't think most people are going to do bracketing. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, you go in that scenario and you know, okay, I can underexpose this two stops exposed to that brightest part of the image, and I know yeah. for a fact yeah. that I'll be able to pull this out later. I do want to mention one thing. No, I'm not, what I'm not, what I'm, I'm not trying to say that the monochrome is something you have to constantly be underexposing by three stops. What I'm trying when to you, say when is- When you go and you are facing a really high contrast right. scene. Is it's what David mentioned just two seconds ago is know your tool, and you work around the tool's function, functions and performance envelope. Mm -hmm. So I mostly, I just have negative two thirds of exposure compensation kind of dialed in as a default Generally, yeah. on the monochrome. Yeah, me too. But, and I did it on the, every generation of the monochrome. Yeah, from the first one yep. to the middle one to the last one. Minus 0.7. Just like when I'm shooting a color camera, I'm mindful of my exposure. Mm -hmm. I Maybe I have it, I end up with an exposure that doesn't require um, brightening or darkening. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do. It depends on the scene. Are there right. a lot of highlights, a lot of shadows? Yep. Is my subject back? Whatever. 
It's the same mindset with the monochrome, just a different technique. Yeah. You're minding your exposure differently. And the reward is an unbelievable amount of dynamic range, an unbelievable amount of highlight, or excuse me, amount of shadow recovery. Yeah. When you saved your highlights, the amount of detail of clean detail in the shadows. And this continues up the ISO range. Well, and, it, and that makes sense because visualize this. We talked about it in the very beginning about what increasing ISO really does. You're just turning up the gain or the camera's turning up the gain on the sensor, increasing that signal. I mean, essentially, when you shoot at ISO 10,000, you the camera is basically shooting at a lower ISO. I'm, this is not actual, don't take my factual word, I'm giving an analogy. <laughs> People are like, that's not true. It's, like, <laughs> it's not true, just gain is not the same thing. But if you take ISO 200 and you crank it up by four stops, well, what do you think you end up with? You end up with the equivalent of a higher ISO image. And if we know that this camera shoots cleanly up into the five digits, yeah. then you shouldn't have a problem because the noise that's there in the shadows at lower ISOs isn't going to magically appear because you know that it doesn't show up at higher ISOs. Right. Yeah. So it's just it's a like, It's like post yeah. processing so the, ISO. The short version of that is no, the monochrome doesn't have less dynamic range than a color camera. It might have more. It has more. It just lives at a different part of the scale. Yeah, lower. So you shoot a little bit differently. Lower you system. you monitor and, and, and calculate and work with your exposure a little bit differently, and you're rewarded with something special. Yeah. And I hope that addresses it. I'm sure that it will not. Nope. <laughs> sure, some people will have it. Well, I, honestly, bit. I welcome counterpoints because that's how we come up with new ideas and techniques. Sure. So um, I'd be curious to know what people who are using the monochrome's experience is with highlights, shadows, and using the tools. I also want to mention, yeah. we talked about workshops. And we've just talked about how important it is that the post-production process is to all files, but especially monochrome files. Sure. David and I both have spent years and years and years learning Lightroom and Photoshop, and, and we have some traditional training as well. But of course, we recognize that not everyone has that same background. Uh, but it doesn't diminish the importance of working in Lightroom to get the most out of these tools that we have available to us. So we recently started offering something kind of cool, which is a one-on-one, uh, -on -one Remote, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, remote Lightroom training with a gentleman named John Latimer, who's a Photoshop and Lightroom expert, professional retoucher, professional printer. He's done crazy stuff. He knows not only how to use the tools, but how to teach them. Uh, but he actually taught me in college. So John was, was my professor. One of his professors. At yeah. RIT. I learned everything I know about Lightroom from him and image editing. So he has, you know, after being taught so well, 10 plus years ago. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we had this opportunity to bring him in, and he actually will um, work with you remotely over your computer and teach you how to both organize your catalog and edit your files. Mm -hmm. And it's you know hourly sessions that you book and as many hours as you want. And he'll cover any topics that you want to cover for Lightroom or for Photoshop. So if you're watching this video and you're saying to yourself, well, David and Josh are talking about highlight recovery and shadow recovery. Well, what is all that? Well I, well, I don't like, I don't know how to do that. I just want to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing here, which is fine. We get that. But there is an opportunity uh, to learn at your own pace on your own computer in your own home to learn these software tools to get the most out of the hardware tools. So I, I do want to mention that. Sure. Uh, because we've, we've only been doing it for a couple of weeks. The response has been really good uh, mm -hmm. so far. Uh, John's, a, lot of, a lot of people signed up for additional sessions because yeah, they're like, oh my done, gosh, I learned so much. Uh, John is on two Lightroom workshops in the store as well. Yep. Um, so we've had we've done group sessions with him and we'll do more in the future. So just something cool I wanted to talk about that does relate. Yeah. Uh, I don't want people to think that they have to throw their hands up and say, I can't figure I don't know this out. Do that, I get right. it. It's complicated. And we, we continue to learn and figure things out. Um, and that's part of the fun, yeah. if you ask me. So that was the longest answer to any question ever. So let's get to the next question before everyone falls asleep. Speaking of highlights, yes. <laughs> do you recommend using center, spot, or multi-field metering? Well, on the, any rangefinder camera, unless you're using live view, you're only getting center weighted. It's center weighted, yeah. Because you're basically at the mercy of the, the dot. Um, I'm get a little close-up shot here. I know it's got to get, get ready for that. So um, the uh, light meter is actually the black and gray and white pattern on the shutter here. That is your center weighted light meter. So the light comes in, reflects off that into the meter. The advanced metering modes, whether they're spot metering or multi-field, those are based off of the sensor because it actually uses the pixels, which are reading light, to take a meter reading. So that means you only get those modes in live view. So since I'm not shooting in live view most of the time, at least not 
that often. I'm not, even if I have those modes activated, I'm not using them because I'm just using the center weighted. So for me, my most important metering tool in exposure tool is compensation. Mm -hmm. David talked about this earlier. David and I both swear by exposure compensation, which is simply dialing in positive or negative bias yeah. to the camera's calculated exposure. And, and on there, you can use the rear thumb wheel if you set direct exposure compensation as on. And this is true on all three versions of the monochrome. Yep. Different, it works a little differently, but the same idea. Maybe so turn it on. This is how I work with exposure. I don't rely on fancy metering modes. I'm simply taking images using exposure compensation to adjust. And if I'm shooting monochrome and I see a bright highlight, in the picture, most of the time, I'm at dialing that in in real time. Um, you can see it through the viewfinder, little numbers like negative or positive. Um, yeah. It's very intuitive, very easy. So, But exposure compensation. Uh, yes, exposure compensation is your friend. I, I think more useful and faster than metering modes, in okay. my humble opinion. So, yeah, so there you, you go. There's exposure right. compensation. Now, I'm just showing you the actual. Does it work with the touch screen? I don't remember. Can you try? Uh, it does not. No? Does, no. Are you no. sure? Yeah. Try it anyway. I don't believe you. Aha! I knew it. Oh. Because <laughs> the M10 monochrome is based on Look the M10 key. Yeah. It's had a touch screen. So I was like, I bet this works. So you can actually touch the screen to change your color. Wow, that is pretty Sweet. cool. Wow, nice. okay. Learned I just, I learned something new. Yeah, look at that. That's what we're here for. That's cool. <laughs> right. So good question. I think we answered it. Let's move on. Okay. So let's go back to filters for a moment. Okay. Um, is there any perceptible loss of image quality when putting a filter in front of the lens? Well, we talked about this in the previous M video, so I won't go too much, but... That's why you need a good filter. A good quality filter? No, as long as it's clean. Mm -hmm. Don't stack filters. Don't have a UVA filter on your, on oh, your no, lens no, no, and then no, pop no. on a color filter on top of that. Right. So a single good quality filter? No. No less than image quality. A, a single good quality clean filter? Yes. They got a big fingerprint on like, there. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. not good. Next question. So going also back to the highlights, okay. can neutral density or polarizing filters help with highlight blowout? No. No, highlight blowout is simply due to an, an incorrect exposure. If your exposure is not correct, your highlights are blown out. There's no filter for that. I mean, I guess in theory... A polarizer could reduce some reflections. Yeah, maybe. In but, certain scenarios but no. with certain subjects. The way to avoid blown out highlights is to expose properly. I don't mean that in a condescending way. I mean no, that no, no, in a no. practice I, makes perfect right. way. And, and just to clarify, you wouldn't want to use a polarizer all the time. Right. Because interesting light bouncing off of things. See the reflection on the top of the camera there? Right? Just right here. Okay. So if I use a polarizer, I don't want to destroy that. Right. I like that reflection because that's the quality of light. Well, with a polarizer, it has to be, it has to be adjusted for every single picture. Yeah, it's not a have, set it and forget right. it type of situation. Yeah, so you have to turn it. It slows you down and it works for certain. Like I shoot cars, I use polarizer for that. Right. But, but it could be for everyday photography. No. It's not advisable to leave a polarizer on all the time. Yeah, the way because to, it has to be adjusted yeah. because it can dull your pictures. Yes, the way to avoid photo highlights is simply to practice with the monochrome, understand where its dynamic range scale lives, mm -hmm. master that, or even just start learning it. I think, I think a great tool for this yes. is setting auto review on. Now I know that you don't like auto review. Well, when I'm learning a new camera, I do. But when you're yeah. learning, yeah, yeah when yeah. you're working though, you don't want to be distracted, yeah. right? Right. Because I, I know we've talked about that before. Yes. But set auto review on and set your, on the playback, set the highlights to flash, a yeah. highlight warning. Yeah. And set it to. Pull that up while you're talking about it. Set it to 253. Okay, 255 is pure white. 253 is just under that, and it'll teach you to have just a little bit of wiggle room. So All if right, you so see this, any of those flashing highlights, this you want to take another shot. Uh, here we go. I'm going backwards. So this is the M10 monochromes. Um, this is, I need to navigate to this backwards. Under the, hold on, I'm going to get there. Capture assistance in the main menu. Let me go. Okay. Capture assistance. Yeah, you can uh, look over here. Clipping. Here. Oh, here we go. You can set your upper limit. So zero is black. 255 is white. Therefore, if you set your upper limit at something, I usually on the monochrome will do something like. Oh, we're getting a little zoom in action. There we, there go. we go. Like 240, for example, just as I'm learning. Wow, that's really as safe. As I'm learning. That's yeah. really safe. So what, what that means is when you take a picture that's overexposed or, or has a highlight value of greater than 240, again, 255 being white, it will blink at you. And it's a very quick and easy visual reference without even looking at the real picture to know if you've lost any of the highlights in your picture, and you will very quickly learn to not how do to it, yeah. not do that. Right. Um, so again, that is 
Then we go back here so you can see. And under capture assistance, we're going to the menu. Yep, capture main assistance, menu. main menu, capture assistance, exposure clipping, and you set your uh, your warnings there. I don't really use the shadow warnings on this camera because I know the yeah, details there. Yeah, forget it. it doesn't I matter. I don't care about any of that. So I'm just focused on the highlights. That's my interestingly opinion. on the first generation mm -hmm. on the on the M9 monochrome, right. it didn't have a shadow warning. It only had a highlight warning. Yes, I always thought that clipping was clipping kind of, definition, was funny, and yeah. it's in percentage. Yeah, it was like two percent, four percent. This makes a whole more sense now. It makes more sense. Yeah. So next question. Um, let's see here. Which current M lenses are up to the full resolution potential of the M10 monochrome? Ooh, I love this question. This one? Well, let's do like um, <laughs> let's 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 pick out a few. I grabbed a few of them sure. today. Um, you want to? Yeah, you take that. Well, the 50 Apple Supercron came out the same day, May 10th, 2012, as the original monochrome. This one. They were they were made for each other, because the monochrome is so demanding. That's, that's right. This was this yeah. was in this was released that same the same uh, day. Yeah. Yeah. So a monochrome sensor, because it has so much more detail and it has more resolving power, is more demanding on lenses in terms of getting the most performance. So you want to use the best lenses to get the best performance. I'm not saying that other lenses are bad. We're talking about someone who says, I have an M10 monochrome. I want to get the most out of that sensor. Yep. 50 Apple Sumicron M. This one. Amazing lens. However, I think that lens has been superseded, in my opinion. Do you? Yes. I believe that the 75 Noctilux Ooh, is a higher quality lens on the M10 monochrome. Just, again, we're, we're not talking about cost. We're not talking about size. We're just talking about one thing only, which performance. is performance. That's it. I get there are more variables, but in this case, we're just talking about performance. This lens is what I did my testing with today, and I was not disappointed. So that is the best. 50 Apple would be second. Uh, 35 one floor uh, floating element. Yeah, this is definitely a lot smaller. <laughs> Let's see yeah. the size difference it's like there. It's half the price, too, I think. Wow. Um, the, uh, but again, 35 you're, you're, right not, you're paying for something when you get that lens. You're paying for something amazing. Uh, 35 on 4, floating element. That lens is spectacular uh, on the M10 monochrome. The Agree. 28 Sumalux, though, I think beats it. 28 Sumalux is, I think, third in line, in my opinion. This is a really good lens. 50 Apo, or excuse me, 75 Octolux, 50 Apo, 28 Sumalux in terms of like best lenses. And, and I think also, I've got it on here now. Uh, oh yeah, this one. Tilt the, it up so they can see it. The the twenty one Super Elmar yes. is outstanding. Unbelievable. It has a especially for black and white, the the contrast, the field of view, and the sharpness are really an excellent match for the monochrome. Uh, I'll I'll say the new twenty eight Sumicron. Yeah, which you've got on the SL two there. Let me show that. Version two twenty eight Sumicron, spectacular. It's it, it splits the difference pretty nicely between the Elmer and the Sumalux in terms of size. Yeah, so you and, look at the uh, Sumalux here. Yeah, it's quite a bit smaller. This is one of these sort of post-digital era design lenses. So those would be my favorites. There's a few others that are I think really the tellies, quite good. Like uh, the, also, if you're not willing to lug around the, the 75 Noctilux, the 75 Sumacron, which yeah, I've got right here. Right there, you've got it, yeah. You know, the 75 Sumacron is an F2 versus a 1.25. Yeah, quite uh, a bit smaller. It's smaller, you know, and the thing is, they have to realize, again, if you're going for fast aperture lenses like a Noctilux 1.25 versus a Sumicron F2, they are going to be very different in size. Yeah. On the monochrome, you're not getting a lens based on its maximum aperture because you need the light gathering capability. You have to rethink the That's whole right. process. That's right. It's almost you, a moot. You don't need yeah. a 0.95. You don't need a 1.4. I mean, you barely right. even need an a F2. Right. You can go out at night with I mean, try lens. Try Elmar. I mean, I'm try Elmar. Yeah, you can go out F4. with an F4 lens. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah. this is great. I'm getting because, amazing what, pictures. Let me ju but just because, so they understand what you're saying. What David's saying is the high ISO capability of the M10 monochrome is so, so good. good. Yeah. You're not choosing a lens based on its aperture for light gathering ability. What you're choosing, choosing it on is for the look. Exactly. The creative effect. If you want, and actually, Josh, before the live stream, was taking pictures of, of Enzo, the dog, with the F1 Noctilux. Well, we'll get to that later. Which uh, we'll talk about. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, it was amazing looking. You know, yeah. so he didn't need F1. Right. Because there's plenty of light in the studio. Right. Obviously, yeah. But, uh, right, you want, it's for creative purposes. It's, yeah, exactly. And so lenses like the 90 F4 macro, uh, this, another line of lenses that, oh, unfortunately, yeah. is not longer made. Um, oh, the Silverettes. 35, 50, 75, 90, F2, yep. 4. Here, I can show it. Uh, you got it, right? Uh, the yeah. Sumerit lenses, I tested um, a bunch of 50s, 
M50s on the M10 monochrome somewhat recently. And I was blown away. Is that a 50 or a 35? I don't even know what I gave you. That's um, a 35. Okay, same idea. I was blown away by the performance of the Sumerits. The 50 Sumerit so good. was actually second only to the 50 Apo. It's amazing, isn't it? In terms of it? sharpness. Wide open. I mean, and it's tiny. And it's an E46 filter thread size. That is, I think, one of the most underrated 50s on a modern digital end. It doesn't have the same magical look as an Octolux or a Sumalux, but... Right. But it's a great companion. Right, just as a street crisp. lens. It's or, crisp. Yeah, it's crisp. small and light yeah. and sharp as heck. Crisp, so. low distortion, all that. Good question, though. I also um, like, um, they're also recently discontinued, but I'm not going to stop using them because yeah. they're in my kit. Uh, the 18 Super Elmar, oh, which yeah. I love. That's yeah. 1838. Mm -hmm. As well as the 24 Elmar, yes. which is also a 38. Yes. And both those lenses are entirely up to the task of resolving 41 megapixel. Yeah. I actually shot with the, the 18, the 24, the 35 Lux, the 50 Apo, when I went uh, and did my my test shooting with the M10 Monochrome. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see what those lenses look like, in, four, in 4K at least, uh, check it out. I've got all the technical data on there in terms of ISO and what lens I used. And aperture, I think, maybe? Yeah. Maybe not? Because, well, uh, okay. again, aperture is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. But you can see uh, the 24 or the 21 or the 18, any of those real wide angle digital arrow lenses yeah. are, are astonishingly good. The Sumerits, while they seem to be starter lenses, yeah. are astonishingly good. So sharp. And, and for the size, match. for the size and the speed of focus, the throw is short and fast, so you can really go quickly and, and, as and you're walking around. I mean, obviously they're not gonna be available to do anymore, but what you about on a pre-owned? Market? Yeah, you're gonna pre-own. How much do you think one of those goes for? Uh, off the top of my head, I'm, I don't even know. Um, I mean, the, the first generation Sumerits, the 2.5s, which are nearly as good. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them are like $1,000. <laughs> it's crazy. There you go. Um, right around there. So now $1,000 is not nothing, but relative to the same Relative to or whatever. What is deal. this? You gotta have context. It's all this about is, context. Uh, how much is this? Oh, do we have any more lens <laughs> questions though? Because we're, we're geeking out about lenses. So what, do we, what else we got about that? Oh, we always get down the lens rabbit hole, don't we? Right, well, it's fun. Lenses! That's, I don't care. This is our show. We do whatever we want. We should have like a little like <laughs> confetti banner lenses. Oh, yeah. What do we got, Jose? All right. We got a question from Bill. Okay. Came in through email earlier. He's asking, how much of the Leica's monochrome look is from the Leica lenses and how much from the monochrome body? It's yes. all from the body. Well, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, the same lens on a monochrome and a color camera is not going to give you a different um, image. Yeah. The same. No, it's it's. I, I see why you're asking that question, but I think that is it, it. You know what it is, and I'll give you the Leica answer. Okay. What what the engineers have told me, because everyone, I don't think it's as big of an issue now when you have cameras like the SL2 and the M10 monochrome, but kind of in the in the early middle days of of Leica getting into the digital game, there was a lot of underestimating Leica's capabilities for digital. So people said, oh my gosh, look at the results from that M camera or that S camera. It, it must be the lenses, mm -hmm. which was a nice way of saying it's not the camera. <laughs> exactly. It yeah. must be the lenses. Yeah. And the, you know, the engineers are like, yeah, but I mean, it's a complete system. We design the lenses and the sensors to work together mm -hmm. to create these images. It's not just one or the other, it's both. So yes, you can use non-Leica lenses. I mean, you could use non-Leica lenses on the SL natively. Uh, and if you've ever shot the difference between say a Panasonic lens and a Leica lens, they don't look the same on the same body. So in that case, is it the body of the lenses? Well, right. it's both, it's the combination. Right. Right. And the same goes for the monochrome. It is a combination of optics matched with digital technology. And that's why those digital era lenses make such a big difference in terms of- Well, the higher technology. resolution Yes, now. exactly. It's tough. They're, they're capable. Yeah. Um, interesting question, though. Um, good. What's that next? is a good question. Oh, we got okay. another lens question in there, I'm sure. Let's, let's let's keep it going. What about vintage lenses? Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm you've been waiting all night for this <laughs> one. <laughs> oh. um, you got, like, hiding stuff back there? I have Ooh, multiple yeah. schools of thought on that. Now, when it comes to outright image quality and sharpness, especially outside of the center, modern digital era lenses are king. They're no the question. Best. There's no, no question, question about it. That's it. The thing is, I find using vintage lenses, especially certain ones, on monochrome cameras in general, and especially the M10 monochrome, to be more fun mm. than using them on a color M camera. Why is that? Well, one of the biggest issues with vintage lenses mm. is... Not corrected for color or chromatic aberration exactly. or get halo or coma. All kinds <laughs> of color artifacting and distracting stuff. Yeah. Some of it you can correct. 
Some of it you can't correct easily. Mm -hmm. Well, on a monochrome camera, black and white, there is no more color artifacting because there's no color. No color channel for blue. So also, if you have uncorrected blue, who cares? The bokeh, the out of focus area oh, on yeah. vintage lenses mm. can be sometimes fun, but also sometimes distracting as colors get merged and start to swirl and be, get weird shapes. Well, no distracting color bokeh because there's no color on the monochrome. Suddenly, true. the true look and rendering of the lens comes out. Now, it's all about- Do you think that's accidental? No, <laughs> and I don't well, think so. Why is that, Josh? Well, because these lenses were designed around something very similar to black and white a monochrome film. sensor, black and white film. There was no color photography when some of these lenses existed, right? Exactly. Or at least it was, color right. photography wasn't it was secondary, the accepted right, mainstream. Right. So I'll give you an example. I see an F1 Noctilux right here. Right, so this is an E58 uh, version three, right? version three F1 Noctilux. So the predecessor to the point ninety five. Uh, this is, I don't know, from the 70s, I think. Yeah, well, maybe. that's the predecessor to the E60. Well, right, I right. mean, skipping generations here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an F1 Noctilux, and a little trivia. Oh, oh, this is good. You guys need to pay attention. Uh -huh. What's the only Leica lens? Maybe only. Well, certainly <laughs> careful. this, oh, oh careful. only is, oh, I should be careful. <laughs> um, was this, let me rephrase, was a Noctilux, F1 Noctilux, ever made in Germany? Good question. What do you think? Well, we <laughs> have to leave it open. Answer. I'm not going to answer. <laughs> well, but it's a trivia for questions for later. Okay, so what, makes, what makes this special? Okay, so this was designed actually in Canada. This was made in Canada. Mm -hmm. All the F1 Noctiluxes were. Um, and it's designed by one of the head of optics for Leica named Walter Mandler, Dr. Mandler. And Mandler designed the F1 Noctilux and actually purposely did not correct the blue channel on purpose. So the blues just do not align with the rest of the wavelengths of light, of red and green, which on color is yeah, challenging uh, to work with. Challenging, especially wide open. Mm -hmm. As you stop down, those channels come together, but wide open, there's a drift and you can get these blue halos. It was designed on purpose that way to give that classic Leica glow on black and white, to give it that really, you know, I'm I mean, gonna try to find that picture I took of the. Yeah, let's find the uh, picture of Enzo. It's not very good, really but cool. uh, the battery is also almost gonna die. Yeah. But can we? If but, we that's, can, uh, but that's basically the thing. So you have these vintage lenses that, that actually, were designed not around see black this and white. Too well, but this is uh, the old pooch, in the studio. I think you need to back up a little bit. Uh, there you go. Oh, Got oh. it. Yep. There he is. There he so, is. I, you know, again, I show, I'm showing you a screen on the screen, but this is a casual photo I took of Enzo. Just while we're setting up. With the uh, F1 Noctilux at F1 using the Visa Flex. And man, that looks really, really cool to me. I mean, it's got an incredible here, I'm gonna, fall off. Here, I'm going to doing that. I'm going to zoom in. Oh, here we go. Oh, look at the buddy. We can use the touch screen. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, it's, it's a, cause it's a yeah, base. Yeah. Going forget. backwards. Look at that face. Anyway, so <laughs> what, what I'm getting at here is Vintage lenses have the advantage on the monochrome of not being susceptible to color artifacting or color fringing or any color issues whatsoever. Yeah. It's all about the rendering, the sharpness or lack thereof, the quality of the shapes of the bokeh, the way the lens vignettes or doesn't. Um, the F1 Noctilux is just one example. This is um, a 51.4 Preospheric, uh, the last, last, last version with an E46 filter size that they came out with before the yeah, uh, 1.4 Spheric. Um, that lens is kind of a nice blend between yep. the modern 50 Lux and the F1 Noctilux. And this lens has a whole new purpose on the monochrome because again, we, we've already gotten this out of the way that there's these amazing modern lenses that give you sharpness and all that good stuff. But you have the opportunity to have so much more fun with vintage oh, yeah. glass combined with the VisaFlex, which is so high resolution relative to the EVF. So it makes focusing a lot easier. You're not reliant on the calibration of, you know, a lot of vintage lenses are not calibrated well or they can't be calibrated well for digital. We can bypass that entirely with yeah. the VisaFlex. So to me, as I, and I'll recap this, vintage lenses are more fun on the M10 monochrome than they are on the M10. Now, what about the reissued mm. vintage lenses? Ah, so like the 28 Cimarron or the 90. Same thing. Sandbar. Except now they're six bit coded and mm. they have all that modern, modern construction. Yeah. You get it with a warranty. Except, again, same idea. Vintage look, modern lens, except no worrying about color, chromatic aberration, or anything. So I think 
once you kind of build an arsenal of a couple of those core incredible lenses, 50 apo if you can, or whatever, you stop there and you start buying or, or acquiring or testing older stuff. Mm -hmm. 35 on 4, a pre, uh, pre spheric or um, uh, 51 5 Sumerit. Um, I tried a 20 nm version 3 Canadian. Thanks, Javier. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> something because crazy. you're no longer reliant on a lens's color performance. Yeah. Which is a huge issue, honestly, uh, and distracting issue on a color camera. It's a whole new world. You know. You know. This is. Uh, here's a little interesting analogy. Yes. Okay. So let's say. You might knock the lux back. <laughs> my knock the But imagine an F1 knock the lux or a 90 Summicron preospheric. Ooh yeah. No, okay. No. Now that's kind of a glowy lens a little yeah. bit, right? Yeah. Or a 75 Civilux, which yeah. actually is based. Which on I've been this. bashing in this whole video series, but now. I know. I know. But now there's <laughs> a reason. Purpose, yeah. A 75 Sumalux, which is actually based on the design for the 50 F1. That's they have right. the same, same optical object, design yeah. with different shape. Um, a rearrangement, if you will. Also designed by Dr. Mailer. So we have these lenses, or, or even like a 21 Super Angulon. Could yeah, be, that's what well, that really lens cool, color right? vignette's like crazy on an M10, but no color. Not on an M10. Now monocolor. you have a really creative there vignette. There you go. There you go. So here is my analogy. If you're into audio or audio listening, right, you might think that. Uh, analog records sound the best, and CDs sound harsh or too perfect, right? Well, imagine that your film camera is the record player, and the M10 monochrome is the, you know, even better than CD. It's right. like, you know, HD, mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. mastered music. Maybe that's not what you're into. Maybe right. you want that vintage feel. Right. So it's kind of like if you put a vintage lens onto an M10 monochrome, it's like you're using a warm tube amplifier on your digital file. <laughs> we're getting real. We're getting no, real this is true. Here. Because what it's doing is adding that extra bit of of warmth and vintage naturalness in, yeah. instead yeah, yeah, yeah. of being kind of cold and and clinical. It's 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 two cameras in one in that respect. Yeah, and, and much more so than a color camera because of all the reasons I just right. I just mentioned. So I have a blast, and I am using the VisaFlex most of the time with vintage lenses, just to get that out Because the calibration is I'm just not, yeah. I don't want to worry about calibration, I don't want to worry about focus shift or any of the other things that could happen with a vintage lens. They they just didn't have the technology that, no. that they do now. So that's fine, I'm, I'm over that. But with the VisaFlex, you have access to this 70 years of vintage M glass, and even longer if you go to screw mount, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? Um, or R glass or anything, to get something out of the monochrome that you couldn't have gotten any other way. And I think I'm going to stop there because we were going crazy. Let's go to the next question. Lenses, lenses, well, lenses. The next question was lenses about for days. the VisaFlex. So yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Will the VisaFlex help with focusing? And also, how is the shutter lag? Well, yeah, the VisaFlex helps with focusing. Shutter lag is nominal, nominal. but there is there is there's some. It's there. I, I mean, but I'm not shooting an M10 at 10 frames a second. <laughs> and again, to come back to that, if you yeah. want zero lag and Get you want SL2. the pure EVF experience, or an SL. We've got a camera for that. Right. So the M is not that. Right. The VisaFlex is no slower than using the rangefinder. It's just the lag, if you will, comes in, comes in differently. It's, it's, well, the reason for it, maybe we should be clear, it's not that it makes the camera slower magically. Right. The sensor has to be open, which means the shutter's open. You're focusing off the sensor, which is giving you the live view image. Mm -hmm. In order to take the picture, the shutter has to close fully first and then activate. Right. Uh, it's an extra cycle. It's there. an extra shutter cycle. So yeah. what you are feel that lag you're feeling, is actually the shutter closing before it opens again, and yeah. then closes again, and then opens again. It's like a. Yeah. It's not bad. I mean, it's way better than the, than the EVF two was on the M10, uh, the 246 monochrome. And it's, and it's infinity times better than the <laughs> M9 monochrome. Which had no EVF. electronic viewfinder. Yes. Oh wait, did it really? No, no, it did not. So okay, VisaFlex I think is very usable. We talked about this a lot more in the M10 uh, live stream. Yeah. So yeah. You can go back to that if you want to. Um, Dig deeper. Yeah. But it, all, everything yeah. for the M10 in terms of live view, VisaFlex, right. playback, right. it right. all applies to well, from the M10P. And just to, to expand on that for a second, is an M10 monochrome, other than the sensor and like one or two menu options, it is, is an identical right? to an M10P. Yeah. Batteries, grips, cases, straps, viewfinders, diopters, you name it, it all fits. It's all the same. There's no difference in terms of any of the hardware. Mm -hmm. The only additional accessory you would have for a monochrome would be a color filter. Other than that, identical. Next question. Comparing the SL2 with the M10 monochrome for eyeglass wearers, which has greater eye relief? SL2. Yeah. Yeah. I huge, mean, it makes sense. The SL2 refinder. is natively built to have an EVF. Yeah. Although the 
the new viewfinder that was introduced on the M10 has yeah. much greater eye relief than the 246. So I would say yeah. if you're considering a monochrome, you're going to want to look at the M10 monochrome, not the 246, because of the greater eye relief, if that's important for you. But what about with the Visiflex on the monochrome? No, Visiflex is good, but no, the SL2... The SL2 is just... Even the original SL, those yeah, cameras I mean, were built around that viewfinder. It wasn't... It's pretty big. It's I mean, good. Right. It's, a, it's fine, but I'm saying uh, the SL2 yeah. is better. It is, like, yeah, the viewfinder yeah. makes up, you know, half yeah. this camera. But so. also, right, it's, look how much bigger it is. So <laughs> there's a drawback. It's a big... Um, I wear glasses. I don't have a problem with the Visa Flex. I was just shooting the dog earlier. I had no issues with it. It has an adjustable adapter on it. Right. Can you show them that, David, while you do the close-up shot? No, on the uh, Viso. Oh, I thought you meant here. Yeah, this has an adjustable adapter there, but the... the... Visa Flex, show them that. On this side. Ah, Right. This is... And, of course, the Visa Flex does one thing the SL2 ZVF doesn't do, which is... Oh, I love this part. It tilts, so you can shoot down, shoot from the hip. It's pretty pretty hard to see that. Uh, Let me grab that. Sorry, I sold the monochrome. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's the same thing. We slide it on the M10 there. Yeah, so this so, is... Yep. This is a regular M10. Again, same, you know, most fully It was closer to grab. That's right. And that's the VisaFlex tilted up, so you can actually shoot down, which is pretty cool. Cannot do that on the SL2. So. Waist-level shooting, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. All so, right. especially for, for street photography, yeah. where you want to be discreet, you know, or... Um, yeah, want to yeah. be discreet in terms of just kind of like looking down or you got a hat on. We covered all this in the M10 video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we talked about this a lot. I'm just going to put a smaller lens on the monochrome for not to Not uh, to rehash. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't want to get So let's go to the next question because that was a good one. Though. All right. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about the differences between the monochrome 246 and the M10 monochrome? Yeah, I think we, we did cover a lot of the changes from the 240 chassis to the M10. Uh, platform in the previous yep. videos, but let's you want to go on a little bit more specifically about the monochrome changes? Sure. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, outwardly, you've got a, a physical difference. I can, yeah, what I can the, gather uh, the cameras. Monochrome. Yeah, it's got to fit the apple on it. There you go. Monochrome's there. 246 right here. There we go. We got so many cameras here. We're like, trying to figure out uh, They all look the same. The situation. All like us look the same. Okay. Sorry. Okay, give me some space there. There you go. Let's see. Let me back these up. So we can see. Okay, there we go. How's that? Is that good, Jose? Good. All right. This way I don't have to wave yeah, them around in the clear air. Hey, space. look at that. Clear up a little space for you, for you to work. There we go. Thank you. There we go. So we we've got here the M10 monochrome, and here we've got the M246. And obviously, you know, from the front, they don't look too, too different. Um, obviously, we could see cosmetic differences. Let's, like, let's, we'll take the glass off so they can really see the yeah, bodies. Sure. Yeah, There we go. Now we can really see. There we go. Got it. You know, you can see here, obviously, you know, certain cosmetic changes, like the buttons are black instead of these, which are chrome. Well, the, two, the M10 monochrome is actually more, um, say, like stealthed out. More, more blacked out. Yeah, right. show them the top. Yeah, look at the different, well, it's hard to see. Yeah, you um, can even see the... Uh, well, yeah. look how much thinner the M10 monochrome is. Yeah, right, let me, let me put them this way so you can see. Yeah. Okay. Because, again, the M10 platform had a lot of improvements over the 240 uh, platform. Yeah. So this, you're going to get all those same improvements, 246 to M10 monochrome, although... But we'll get into this. Right. So let's just say, the... so basically, in terms of physical differences, the M10 monochrome, because the M10, it's four millimeters thinner than the 240 generation chassis. And that allowed them also to make a bigger, brighter viewfinder by, by limiting that size. And it is also the same size as, I'm just going to put that up there, it's the exact same dimension as. This is an MA, which Ooh. is a film camera, right? Yeah. Which, if you put black and white film in here, it's a monochrome. So we, <laughs> we have a black and white film camera. You got a black and white uh, digital camera. But essentially, they are identical. I'm going to line them up this way. Essentially identical in terms of their Look at the similarity. That's amazing, isn't it? Oh, I love right. it. Right. Now, you see here on the, on the film camera, we've got a rewind knob. On the um, M10 monochrome, M10 monochrome <laughs> we've got an ISO <laughs> dial. I think we're talking about right. The shutter speed, you know, uh, dial is in the same position. It's a little different size. The, the the shutter actuator is in the same spot. Yeah, the shutter speed dial on the MA is a throwback to the M3 when you had the meter yeah. that slid into the dial. Uh, well, we can talk more about that on the analog. Right. We'll screen. get there. Yeah. So anyway, there. So there's a lot of similarities yeah, with the film camera. Let's not get too distracted with the film camera though, because we're talking about monochrome versus monochrome. I will Boom. say. Um, 
Maximum ISO? What are, what are the differences there, David? Uh, significant. Okay, well, what is the maximum ISO on the 246? Well, that's a good... Uh, Not maximum usable ISO. Just what's the, like, oh, the maximum ISO. We're okay. talking tech specs comparison. Tech specs. Yeah. So the maximum ISO on the 246 is 25,000. Mm -hmm. And the max ISO on the M10 monochrome is 100,000. Mm -hmm. That is a big difference. Also, the lowest ISO is a big deal. So on the M246, because remember that color filter was stripped away, it's a ISO 320 is its base ISO. That is a little bit problematic if for creative purposes, you want to shoot wide open. If you do that on the 246, you're going to need to use an ND filter. Uh, if you want to shoot at 1.4, let's say. On the M10 monochrome, the base ISO goes down to 160 now, which means you may not need that filter, which is pretty cool. And I want to mention one other thing, a huge difference is maximum exposure time on 246 is one minute. Mm -hmm. M10 monochrome, mm -hmm. 16 minutes. Yeah, big for, difference. So for long, long exposure, low light, nighttime stuff, that's a big difference. That is cool, yeah. yeah. And of course, the 246 it uses the EVF2 electronic finder, and the monochrome uses the uh, VisaFlex, which is a superior finder. We can just pop them on there, although it's larger, so you know that's something to think about. Um, now, that being said... They both do angle, though. Yeah, the, the 246... And we'll, we should probably tell them why we know this. Um, in 2020 is amazing. Yep. I. Uh, well, why do we know this, Dave? Why do we? Because we said we were going to tell them. Yeah. Them okay. Let's, let's, now, let's, now let's, we got to. Now, now we're talking get about comparisons. So let's. What do we got coming? Okay. What do we got coming up for these guys? All right. So I have been working for the last week on this. I More was, than a week. I think. About a week. Yeah. Okay. About a week. I started last weekend. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I have been kind of working towards this, plodding along, and doing a lot of testing of uh, the the cameras to see where that, remember we talked about that performance envelope and knowing what they are actually capable of under ideal perfect conditions. Right. Because that helps us as photographers understand how far we can push our tools and what we can get away with. Not just get away with, but get great results right. at certain settings. Right. So, you know, personally, when I review cameras, I go out and I shoot them. I'm like, okay, camera, let's go. I'm gonna make some work. Because there's no better way to know how a camera performs than to shoot the camera under varied conditions. But at a certain point, it is important to know how does this compare to that? Right, especially and if you're going from one model to the next. Right. You're spending your hard-earned money you on You wanna know version. what you're getting. Right. What, am I, what am I actually getting what's better? And when push comes to shove and you have a near impossible shooting scenario and you're like, do I dare go to 100,000 ISO? Right. Either, like, is it even worth it, or do I just put my camera away and forget about it? Right. Well, I am, uh, I've done all these comparisons, and I have an article going up on Red Dot Forum within uh, the next day or two, mm -hmm. which will be a comprehensive comparison between the M246 monochrome, the M10 monochrome, the M10P converted to color, and the SL2 converted to color. Or you mean to black, to black and white. And white. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. The M10 monochrome, I'm sorry, the M10P converted to black and white and the SL2 so converted to black cameras. and white. Four cameras. Four cameras. Compared. Battle Royale. That's right. And if you say, well, what about the Q2? It's like, okay, listen. <laughs> we have, yes, the opening photos are involved in testing every ISO. And the reality is the Q2 and the SL2 render very so similarly. Similar, right. So this, this is the most efficient way to show the differences yes. in terms of what, what are we going to, without drawing any conclusions, make them read it. But what are they, they going to learn or what are, what are we testing? In this it is a few things. One is how astonishingly good all of these are oh, up to... Oh, that's a caveat answer. Oh, there's a caveat. Okay. Up to, <laughs> let's say, 6,400 or 8,000. Right, there's right. actually very little difference. Between We're not going to spoil the surprise. I don't want to spoil it. David worked really hard on this. But when you start getting into those higher ISOs, you're going to really yeah. see the difference. And like Josh said, a little pre-spoiler... The 246, for being a generation old, <laughs> it's amazing. or one and a half generations yeah, old, technically, really, yeah. or two, uh, holds up remarkably well yeah. in 2020. Like we, I think David and I... More than a little bit. Um, it's easy to dismiss the last gen when you got the new hotness. When the we, new hotness think, is great. But I think we did that, and um, from both of our testing that we he, I've done today and he's done this week, we have a kind of a renewed... Uh, appreciation for the 246 and and we're talking about five years five years after it came out 
Um, it's good. So yeah, but you'll see that. Um, it's so, good. But yeah. I would say, kind of to distill it, yes. the two forty six as you get into the really high SOs, like twelve thousand five hundred, um, twenty five thousand, as you get towards its limit, it does flatten out the details a bit. Right. And you're going to so, see. You'll see it. I've seen the images already, and he went crazy with these comparisons. You're going to have a very, very clear assessment of how these four cameras perform at all ISO settings, um, detail, tonal range, noise, yep, everything. Um, so that'll be published in the next day or two on Red mm -hmm. Dot Forum. Mm -hmm. um, we'll probably add the link in here. In the yeah, I'll add it when, to the when it's available. And, and um, just as a kind of to as a little bit of a teaser, just give me one second here. There. So. While he's pulling it yeah. up, so what I'll say is, this is an opportunity if you either own one of these models or are thinking about buying one of them to see how they perform at that performance envelope yeah. and you know where they fit into your workflow and the, and the aspects that and of how could they can complement something else? Absolutely, yeah. Because look, of course, you're also going to see what it means to have 47 megapixels versus 24 in right. the previous generation monochrome. It's a pretty sizable difference in terms of detail resolution. But you might like the high ISO capability of the monochrome, especially for black and white work, rather than the SL2. So there's, you know, right, it's different tool for a different task. But what do we got uh, up on the screen there? Yeah. So so if we look there over we here, uh, this is on Red Dot Forum, and the last time I did this test was five years ago, which is amazing because so much has come out in five years. Uh, but I did this initial test when the 246 came out, and you can see here I did a little still life setup here. This is what it actually looks like in color, and then that's black and white. And I've done something similar, it's a little different setup, but uh, what you'll see is something like this, where I run through ISO and I run through different sections of the image, and you'll be able to go through and see the difference uh, in different areas. So I've, just like on, on my initial article, I've selected areas for high frequency information with a lot of detail. I've selected images, uh, an area of the image where it has really smooth tones another area that has a lot of textural detail. Yeah. So, because it's not one or the other. It's not like I can just show you pictures of a, of a focus target, you know, or in this case, a bottle with printing and say, that's it. No, there's more to it because there's that textural nuance. There's that yeah. smooth areas where yeah. you don't want it to be grainy. So, you know, that's the idea. So David has done all like the that. work for everyone who's thinking about which model works for them. So please, oh, my gosh. check this out yeah. when it's up. Um, because it is fascinating, it is enlightening, and I, you know, we had a lively discussion about the images earlier today, really diving into it, and I think everyone who reads it will, will learn something and be, and be interested in it. Hopefully. So, hopefully. Uh, and obviously, uh, once you do read it, if you have questions about the contents, leave a comment, email us, whatever, and then we can obviously expand on, on anything. Um, now, we're getting into the, the final throws here. We have time for a few more shorter yeah, let's, let's questions, like a, quick, maybe? like a quick rundown and just... Yes or no questions, maybe? Quickly over the, over <laughs> okay. the questions. Um, all right. So let's see. What is your favorite... I think you answered this, but what is your favorite 50 millimeter lens for the monochrome? Well, my favorite when it comes to absolute sharpness, 50 apo. My favorite when it comes to size versus performance, 50 sumer at 2.4. Mm. My favorite for portraits, 51.4 a spheric. My favorite for fun... Knock Deluxe. <laughs> I mean, like I Wait, know. That, oh, I know. Well, no, I, I, this is, that was a David answer, and I'm terribly sorry. Wait, I would have just one, said 50 one Apple. One David yeah. is enough, um, because there isn't one lens that does it all. But when it comes to the lens that gives me the best bang for my size and performance, I 50 think 50 Apple. Apple. 50 Apple is 39 millimeter filter size, retractable hood, focus tab, small, uncompromising performance I, with really clean can, bokeh. That you own that lens, and it works on the SL2, on the M10 monochrome, on film. In 50 years, it's still going to be insane. So, Josh, what what lens did I use for testing all these cameras? The 50 Apo. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Next question. All right. Uh, first lens uh, for a monochrome. Any suggestions? Well, the same. That would I think be the same logic applies. Yeah. Like any M, I yeah. would suggest a 35 or a 50. Yeah. Depending on what you're going to shoot, but a 35 one four or, or a 50 F2 yeah. or one four, depending. And there's so many options. I don't like to give a blanket answer because everyone is going to have a different. I mean, and the reality matter. is that even a 35 Summicron Aspheric version two is right. actually really sharp, Fantastic. and that would be a great lens on the monochrome oh, yeah. if you're looking to start. With the 11 bladed aperture, it's going to yeah. be really nice. So they, it just depends. It depends on your budget. Because again, you don't size. need a you don't need a one four. That's right. It just depends on what you're what you're aiming for. But interesting. Next question. All right, doing good. What about repurposing an M8 as a black and white camera? Um. Well, you could. I don't. 
I don't know. I wouldn't want to make, like physically alter the sensor. People do. I wouldn't. I suppose you could do I that. I have actually... The only case... There's one oh, case where I find it interesting and okay. fascinating. And I've seen samples, and it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the design features, accidental features of the M8 is that it's very sensitive to infrared light, which means in order to shoot color photography, you need to use a UV IR blocking filter. Otherwise, like, you know, my shirt would be purple. Uh, that's good if you want to shoot black and white. You have the sensor converted to black and white. Uh, you can use it as an infrared camera. Yeah. And use an infrared block, like a visible light blocking filter. Or yeah. it's just, the o just get an M9 monochrome or, an M or just get a 246 monochrome. Yeah. By the time you buy an M8 and have it converted, and then cost you a lot of money. All the money you lose on it because no one's going to want to buy it when you want to yeah. sell it. Um, my, my okay, yeah. My simple advice: buy, no, a, two, buy a 246. No, buy or. Yeah. Or an M9 monochrome or that, if you yeah. really like the CCD price. Next question. All right. Can a minimum ISO be set for, for the ISO auto setting? Mm, I mean, no, not in the menu, not, but you through use, you could you could get around that. So what I think this question is basically an auto ISO on the M10 monochrome, you have the ability to set the Upper threshold, limit. Yeah. how high the camera's ISO is allowed to go on its own before you override and go into a manual ISO. Because mm -hmm. right, you may... Personally, find your threshold for noise is 6,400 or 8,000 mm. or whatever. Well, I'm saying everyone has their own yeah, personal threshold. Sure. Some people, I mean, I, you and I both shoot at 50,000 all day, but we're crazy. Um, so whatever your threshold is, you, you set it. And that's as high as the camera will go. Now, normally, you don't really worry about how low the camera's going to go because right. the lower the ISO, the higher the quality. Yeah. So the lowest ISO is good. The now, best quality, yeah. You may say, well, I don't want it to go too low because then my shutter speed is going to get too slow. Well, that's where you set in your, your auto speed. ISO menu the shutter speed threshold, the minimum, or I guess the maximum exposure time, which is the slowest shutter I mean, speed. Yeah. I mean, personally, because of that high ISO capability, and I actually do use auto ISO yeah. pretty much all the time on the on the M10 monochrome, mm -hmm. uh, I set it at 500th of a second because yeah, I want not? sharp pictures. Yeah. And I don't care if it's... 3,200 or 10,000 because yeah. it looks the same. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's an advantage. We kind of talked about that earlier about that high ISO performance is you can put auto ISO at a 500th of a second or a 250th or whatever you're comfortable with. So, and you're going to get, I would much rather have, and I say this every video. What, say, I say, say it this, again, say it again. I will always take a grainy picture over a blurry picture. If I have to raise my ISO to make sure my shutter speed is high enough so that my, sh my shot is sharp, I'm doing it 10 times out of 10. Done. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you answering it? Let's move on. <laughs> We're getting late. We're getting late. You're going crazy. All right. So the big question is, what is the availability of the M10 monochrome? Well, that's a good question. So much like any new release, the M10 monochrome, any new release from Leica, the M10 monochrome is hard to get. Uh, they announced in January. I'm not going to speak for anyone else but us, but we do still have a waiting list for the camera. Um, the thing is, Leica has has kind of shot themselves in the foot a little bit because they made it too good. They they make these tools that in modern times now are so good and not good for a Leica, good, good, good. as a camera, yeah. good as a tool in a use case environment. So the demand for these tools, SL2, M10 Monochrome, is higher than ever, but it's not like Leica suddenly can make 10 times as much product. Than no. Them. These are still handmade, hand painted, hand tested uh, products. Also, so, just as a point of note, yes. I mean, they're not running at full staffing in the in the factory right now due to distancing. So, uh, that, yeah, but even before even before that, we had though, any production challenges. Now it's uh, worse. And I don't, I haven't been over there. I don't know right lately. I don't know what's going on. But all I'm going to say is, like any major Leica release, there's a waiting list. Uh, it took us a year plus to fill the 240 waiting list. It took us a year to fill the M10 waiting list. Um, we're still working our way through the SL2. It's uh, it's annoying, I get it, because you want your camera. We're at the mercy of supply. I would much rather like and make them good and make them well and take their time than rush them out and have bugs, which they've had in the past. They've had some of their 10 years ago, you know, they may just even talked about had a bug, had a problem. They rushed it out and... So, yeah. of course, if you own a 246 monochrome, you probably forgot that you have to wait a year and a half to get it. Because it's been out for five years. Because you've been shooting with it for so four and a half it's, years. It's you got to have a little bit longer term view too. That yes, it is frustrating to have to wait, but you will eventually get it, and you will eventually use it and love it. For now, they're operating on like a five-year product cycle, so you've mm -hmm. got five years um, to drool over it before maybe something else comes out. But so I understand that it's frustrating. 
um, you know, because of the the nature of them, we don't get a lot of insight into okay how many how many are coming in or it's just not it's not that clear. Um, even for us to have a demo unit, we have one that we have here for the kind of testing David needs to do. It's not like we have five of them sitting around. And that was like um, you know blood and sweat. Yeah, and it wasn't and... like I mean it's it's challenging for us to get them. So, but it's not forever. Like every release, you have your waiting period, the list ends, ends, and then they're in stock, and everyone forgets that they have to wait because they're too busy shooting. So um, I will also mention there is a, because um, I get this question all the time, they announced a Lights Vetslar edition of the M10 right. Monochrome right. uh, in We March. don't have that here. We don't. Yeah. That has not shipped yet. Right. They have not said when they're going to ship them, so we're just kind of hanging in and waiting. That means we haven't seen one. We don't know when, so don't ask me that in the comments. When's the Lights Vetslar Monochrome? I'm sure. It's worth. I have wait. one right here. Yeah, that's right. Wait, what? <laughs> it's worth the wait. We have a lot of great tools available to us now, um, including the 246, which, as you'll discover from David's article, is no slouch. Ain't no slouch. And less than half the price <laughs> if you buy a used one. Um, and still available new if you look carefully. So, yeah. Well, they had some special edition and monochromes yeah, over the years. Well. Yeah, like, there's a lot yeah. of options um, yeah. for 246 um, shooting. The so, Jim Marshall, if you can get a hold of that one, oh, that's yeah, so cool. So cool. So. I have a video on that, too. Um, it won't last forever. There will be a time when the waiting list is done and they'll be in stock. Just it's We're only four and a half months in to the launch. And it, again, most time, it's it's a year before we have something in stock. So hang in there, guys. Stay, Please. Stay strong. Stay strong. <laughs> stay strong. Next question. Let I'm me squeeze in. Yeah, I think we got time for one or two more. Oh, yeah, we got time. Um, we did talk a lot about you know, all, all the information that the MT Monochrome holds and all the shadows that you can pull and everything, but would you recommend shooting it in JPEG only? No. No. If you're not ready to shoot RAW in the sense that you don't know how to use Lightroom or you're not sure what to do with the files, shoot RAW plus JPEG. Shoot both. That way you've got the RAWs ready to go for when you learn the software, but you mm -hmm. have the JPEGs immediately so you can do what you need to do with them. And like Josh said, if you are asking that question, should I shoot JPEG only because I don't know what to do with my RAWs, I highly recommend taking a either just a one-on-one -on -one session or watching YouTube videos. Right, you don't have to, you know, you can sign up for John's session, which is cool, but yeah. let's say, but I mean, it doesn't, or, right. you can't do that or whatever. There's still a ton of great resources online. Yeah, just um, go, like YouTube. Just YouTube. There's so many people. <laughs> You're watching us on YouTube, you clearly know how to get there. Yeah. Um, take advantage of the resources available to you because if you're shooting JPEG only, you're missing out. You're missing out, mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case especially. Um, so just don't do it. Just don't do it. Next question. All right. So on that one, I think he was referring also to the size of a raw photo in the MT Monochrome. They're very large. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the march of progress, people. You know, the, the higher quality the camera files get, the bigger the files get, you get one of these bad boys, 256 gig Lexar card, which we talk about every live stream, so please remember. And you're fine. Yeah. Yep. Compared to... The cost of the hardware, and compared to the sacrifice of saying I'll shoot less so I have smaller cards, no. it's not worth it. No, it's not worth it. Get ten cards. Get a card wallet. Like uh, I don't know where mine went, but it's somewhere. Uh, you get a card wallet. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought I had it right handy. No, I'm oh, I see it right there. Where? Next to the reflect. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna get it. Next to the dog. Next to the dog. Here we go. Josh disappeared. I got it. So this is my uh, think tank. Think tank, pixel, pixel pocket, pocket rocket, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, I will show you guys that here in the close-up camera. It's um, very fashionable accessory. So this holds all of my gazillions. I have like some super OG ones in there for like testing um, M8s and stuff. Um, I get one of these. It fits in my pocket, and I can carry a ton of cards in there. I might put my business card on one side, and you're good. So. Yes, the files are bigger. I was sure hope so at 40 megapixels. And you get a fast card, you get a couple of them, and you're good. Don't worry about it. Moving on. Next question. All right. Um, did the M9 monochrome suffer from sensor corrosion? Uh, you want to come back to us? Yeah. I, I love my shirt. It's very nice. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we gave it on a matching today. So This was not planned. Uh, yes, the M9 monochrome, the M monochrome, the original one, did suffer from the CCD corrosion issue. Mm-hmm. If you own one and you have not had the sensor replaced, uh, I believe they started replacing these sensors with the Years updated corrosion-proof version in 2016, I think. Um, yeah. You can look that up. So if you own, a, own an original monochrome 
and you have not had your sensor replaced, you probably have corrosion at this point. It may be minor and not interfere, it may be major. You want to have the sensor replaced by like a customer care. There's also some upgrade programs to upgrade to newer, like an M10, things like that. Right, so, it, might, it might be financially not as attractive to pay for the sensor based on the value of the camera, but Leica right. will give you far it's more like, than um, the value of the camera towards a new one. Yeah, it's like $1,650. It's a lot. Give or take to have a new sensor put in. Yep. Um, but before people complain about that, I mean, it's, it's basically Leica honored a voluntary recall for years. Yeah, for no a charge. long time. And eventually years. the supplier, I guess. Yeah. And they're only charging you, I think, for the cost of the labor. I mean, it's like a subsidized, yeah. you know, because for 1600 whatever, you it's get everything. a new sensor, a full overhaul, a one-year warranty. I mean, it's not just- New they covering. Just, they're not just taking it, adjustment. Just popping off the sensor. And, um, to get to the sensor, the entire camera has yeah, to be Yeah, so they, they, you get like a brand new camera, effectively, at that point. So if you love your M9 monochrome, or your M9 or your M9P, if you have an original sensor, it's actually kind of worth it if you're going to keep it for a long time, because mm -hmm. you're getting that full overhaul and that one-year warranty. So, good question. Awesome. Next. Should you shoot in sRGB or Adobe RGB if you set the camera to RAW and JPEG? It doesn't make a difference. doesn't make a difference. I yeah. mean, it's black and white. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But if you're shooting a color camera, it doesn't matter because a color profile is not assigned to yeah, a the, RAW the, file. Yeah, so. the color file, the, the profile, sRGB, Adobe RGB, is only relevant to the JPEG itself. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. The RAW file is actually a larger color space than yeah. Adobe. And it's not embedded in the RAW until no. you convert it to something else. Correct. Next question. All right. Do S medium format cameras render superior black and white images compared to the 35? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know you. yet. I, I did not have you. the time to test this today. I told oh you. So I was like, ask that. so did you do the S? Well, like, I tried, but I was testing oh. every other camera on demand against these. So oh, man. That is an excellent question. I, I can't answer that honestly because I have not put them side by side, especially the new M10 monochrome, which is mm -hmm. very close, slightly higher resolution. And we certainly haven't had a chance to test it against the S. Three Here's because what I'll say. we don't have an S3 here. We're going to do a video about the S system. Yep. Um, we can talk about it then. We can talk about it then. Yeah. Because um, I don't want to give a flippant answer. I want to give an informed answer. No, we answer. really want to know. You know, David and yeah. I do a lot of testing, uh, both just in the course of our daily lives and also to prepare for the questions we know we're going to get. So it's a good question and a valid one, only in the sense of curiosity. They're two totally different cameras. Right. Um, although similar price points pretty owned. Well, but, um, and if you look at a 007 at 37 yeah. and a half megapixel versus yeah. an M10 monochrome at 41. Yeah, no, I get why there's that curiosity there. So I will do that test at some point, probably before we do our S uh, live stream and um, we'll find out. That is a good question. But it's, and, a, it's an amazing question. I just don't... I, and, I, and I did not include the S in my no, no. test. It is it is something we're going to play with at some point. On its own. So keep an eye out on this space. Jose? All right. I think... Um... Well, I want to talk briefly real oh, quick. Oh, yeah. What? You um, brought some goodies. About inspiration. Because we talked a lot about getting out and shooting and all these tools. Um, one of the cool things about the M Monochrome is that there are a number, I brought a few, a number of, of books by professional, talented, incredible uh, photographers, artists, shot exclusively with monochrome cameras of the varying generations. Probably not the M10 monochrome yet. Um, I'm gonna scoot some of this over. I've got a few of them here, about three of them uh, with me today. This one's gonna be hard to see because it is um, no, black on black. No, it's oh, fine. Yeah. This is uh, No Plan B by David Carroll. This is, uh, yeah, get shot with a monochrome. <laughs> I'm gonna do a bad job here. Uh, these books are all on the Like a Storm Amy website. Um, amazing work amazing, here. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna kind of run through them super quick. I don't wanna, uh, I'm gonna show this one last. So this is, uh, Passing Fancies by Louis J. A lo local photographer. Local, uh, this is like bigger than the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hold sorry. on, hold on. There we go, that's bigger than my It's face. a very large book. Um, again, shot with the M10, or with the... Um, I think the M9 monochrome? I can't remember. M9 monochrome and, and the 246. And the yeah, both. Uh, super, super cool, amazing work. Again, all shot with the monochrome. It's street photography in Paris. Uh, we had this gallery show in the Leica store this year, or last year? And year? unfortunately, uh, right about... Like in three weeks, we were supposed to do a street photography workshop with Lewis in Paris. And we will. It'll happen. But it's going, it's pushed to next year. Yeah, it'll happen. So yeah, you have the opportunity to learn from him. And the last one I want to show for now um, is, I have an extra bonus uh, for this one. This is uh, One Woman by uh, John Body and Alicia Ho. So this- We even have his camera here. What's, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he's just I like, run the surprise. He's like that, that kid who just tells you what's in the present. Um, this was shot all in the original M monochrome, the M9 monochrome, and with a wide variety of vintage lenses and like one um, lamp. Yeah, they're all vintage. It's all vintage glass. All vintage glass. Uh, can we get a close-up on this? This is uh, all, every picture of this book is of Alicia in different outfits, different lighting, different poses. It's unbelievable. 
Uh, we did this gallery show in the store, and just to see this, these printed huge was stunning. Um, and here's the thing. So we have the one one book. We also have the actual M monochrome, not the lens, the actual M monochrome that John used to photograph this it's book, which he had a, <laughs> <laughs> engraving, which he had a custom engraving done, uh, I believe in Germany by uh, the factory, to uh, commemorate the... Uh, I think you got to back up a little bit. There you go. Boom. There we go. So you can see it's got the... Oops, I'm doing a David. Yes. One woman engraving, and then John and Alicia's signatures right on there. So, and it's got like a custom leather on it and a really red stuff grip. This is cool. I have the Sumeron on here now. Anyway, so my point is, is there are a number of books. These are just a few um, that are shot exclusively with the M monochrome. So if you either have a monochrome or you're looking to get one and you want some inspiration, there are a lot of ways to, of to get there. that. A lot of really amazing, amazing work that we've been lucky enough, uh, some of it to actually show in the store, huge, in the gallery, huge. Um, and see these massive prints and be in, in really blown away. So this I, is a crazy thing. Yes. This is a crazy thing. Sometimes on the amount of detail that you have on the monochrome, you can't fully appreciate it mm. until you print it. I mean, not big, really big. Yeah. Because uh, we've done sample prints at, at 24 by 36, which is pretty, that's a pretty big pretty print. Pretty big, yeah. Right? Not big enough. No. On the no. 246, yeah. to actually see the level of detail on the 246, yeah. right, in perfect conditions with a 50 APO and all mm -hmm. that, because mm -hmm. um, I made a print off of my initial uh, ISO testing that I showed you, that, that's still life, and I made a 40 by 60, and it had noticeably more detail yeah, it's amazing. than the 24 by 36. I mean, not by a little bit. Yeah. You could see information in the print that you just couldn't see at, the, you know, the small size of two foot by three foot. Yeah. Uh, so that's on the old monochrome. The new monochrome, yeah. I think you'd have to print it basically wall size yeah. to get into the details. Well, I think I think we've we've done a good job. We've gone on quite a while. Obviously, we want you to continue asking us questions. Yeah. Um, David, I'll be around on the comments. Yeah, David does an excellent job. He will reply to your comment if you have a question that's relevant to the video. But fair warning, I am prioritizing the article, so. I am actually going to work. He'll, he'll get there. Give him I a couple days. There. Give him a couple days. Give me a couple um, days. Uh, once once the other article goes live yeah. in terms of the ISO comparison, uh, then I will I'll loop back around and I do promise I will get to all the comments on on this video. Yeah. Uh, if you're just joining or have missed the beginning, there's a lot of links in the description below. Yes. With lots of resources, the the previous black and white showdown, reviews of the first two generation monochromes, the video of test shooting with the new M10 monochrome, uh, lot, lots of good resources there. And uh, also there's a link to sign up for the email newsletter if you want to be alerted to things. Mm -hmm. Do subscribe to the channel, click notifications, because when, when that new article goes live, I'll be posting just a status update on YouTube also, you can check out uh, Red Dot Forum on Facebook. I'll post an update there. Mm -hmm. Any way that you can just stay in touch with us, yeah. we appreciate it. Yeah. And We're going to keep this going. We're going to keep doing this, okay. and we are excited to bring yeah. this information out there, and we welcome feedback, um, suggestions for new live streams, topics, yep. anything that you know you think can we can cover in this kind of format, we welcome it because we're having a good time. Leave it in the comments. Yes. Uh, or email us or call email us, us or whatever. Don't be afraid of the uh, the thumbs up. We like that. Mm -hmm. Let us know that we're doing a good job. If we're doing a bad job, keep it to yourself. That's right. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, don't keep, it, don't keep it in the comments. Let's be real. <laughs> no, just, you you can reach us. Yeah. And um, uh, next week we're going to be doing uh, another exciting episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. That's right. It should be the same time, pending any changes. Obviously, just subscribe. You'll know because we'll, yep. you'll get a notification when we uh, post our next pending live stream. So thank you, as always, yep. to Josh. That's right. To Jose. And what about Enzo? Kirsten. Hold on. I got to get a little treat for the dog. Come here, buddy. Enzo. You want this? Oh, we got to get the Enzo cam going. You want this? He's like passed out. Come here. Oh, oh no. He's going to come up. Him? Oh, there he oh, is. Oh, my goodness. It's a tradition, go. right? Up, up. You got to do this. Up, up. Come on, up, up. Go. Jump. Jump. He's like. No. He's, so he's too tired. He's, he's so tired. <laughs> Can you see him? He's not even wanting to oh, jump he's not the tree. It. Up, up. Come here. Come on, oh, up, up. There he is. Pop. Pop. <laughs> oh, can we see him? <laughs> Yay. He earned his Yay! tea today. Oh, good boy. What a good boy. All right, we will end on that note. Um, thank, you, thank you, as always, for tuning in. You make it worthwhile for us to do this. 
And we look forward to seeing you in the comments. And <laughs> like a shark. And please tune in next week where there'll be more Enzo and maybe even some cameras that we'll talk about. Maybe. Maybe. Have a good Until night, then, everybody. have a good one. Stay Thank safe. Thank you, guys.